It's time for Twit This Week in Tech. Great panel for you today, Nate Langson from Bloomberg, Devendra Hardawar from Engadget, and a newbie. You're going to be nice to Kate O'Neill, the tech humanist. We'll talk about the wacky GE light bulb reset, the ambitious plans behind Facebook's new cryptocurrency, and the sim swap horror story. It's all coming up next on Twit. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twit, This Week in Tech, episode 724, recorded Sunday, June 23rd, 2019. Paste and match style. This Week in Tech is brought to you by Capterra. Find the right tools to make an informed software decision for your business. Visit Capterra's free website at capterra.com slash twit. And by Atlassian. Atlassian software powers the full spectrum of collaboration between IT teams and the rest of your organization. Visit Atlassian.com slash teams slash IT to see what IT can be by giving their products a try for free. And by HelloFresh. HelloFresh shops, plans, and delivers step-by-step -step recipes and pre-measured ingredients so you can just cook, eat, and enjoy. For $80 off your first month, go to HelloFresh.com slash twit80 and use the code twit80. And by Wasabi Hot Cloud Storage. Thinking about moving your data storage to the cloud? Wasabi is enterprise class cloud storage at one fifth the price of Amazon S3 and up to six times faster with no hidden fees for egress or API requests. Calculate your savings and try Wasabi with free unlimited storage for a month at wasabi.com. Code TWIT. It's time for TWIT this week in tech, the show we cover the week's tech news. A great panel uh, this week back for uh, a reprise of his starring role in 2018. I don't know what I'm saying. Devendra Hardwar is your senior editor at Engadget. Hello, Devendra. Hello. Happy to be here. There was as some always. With newborns, how are they doing? She's good. Um, Sophia just hit, what, eight months? So big uh, milestone. She's happy. She's laughing. Uh, not you know the sleep we're still working on, but she's great. And uh, we've already done some gadget stuff with her. She's a bud budding gadget reviewer at this point. Budding gadget reviewer. Yeah. Is she reviewing baby gadgets? Yeah. Yeah. There's so many, and so many are terrible. And she has a good bad gadget face. I so, saw your like, mama. If, if, your mama roo. Oh, the mama roo. Yeah. <laughs> she doesn't like it at all. She doesn't like the mama roo. She hates it. And I know I, I know some parents who've had kids who love it. It's just every kid is different. That's the main advice. So reviewing baby gadgets is even weirder than normal gadgets. It's yeah. all about personal preference. It's very, yeah. very, yeah, babies. You know how they are. Yeah. <laughs> uh, also back uh, for more, Nate Langson, the tech editor at Bloomberg, from uh, joining us from the UK. Hi, Nate. Hey, Leo. Hey, guys. Thanks. I'm very sleepy, so I'm going to do my best. I promise. I promise. If if you uh, start to drift off, just get back on those drums. Pound the skins. <laughs> wake I, us up, too. I, I know how much you desperately want. Every time I'm on the show, <laughs> Every like, time. do a drum solo. Do I can't help it. you got a drum kit behind you. It's going to come up. <laughs> it's, it's true. There it is. <laughs> you, tell the Thanks. truth. You haven't played those in 12 years. No, I haven't played those in about 12 hours, actually. Oh, so, good, good. Yeah, nice. Frequent. Yes. And we have a brand new panelist. I'm very excited uh, to have join us. Kate O'Neill. She is a humanist. What the hell? In tech. Hi, Kate. Great to have you. <laughs> Thank you. KOinsights.com. Her book, Tech Humanist, is great. And uh, I think we had you on Triangulation talking about it. So we thought this, That's is, right. this yeah. would be great to have Kate on, uh, on, on Twit, too. Because we need some humanity in technology these days. <laughs> okay. uh, indeed. Technology needs humanity for sure. And the first thing, of course, you and uh, Devendra started talking about is the GE light bulb. Yeah. What's that all about? It has a big uh, flurry on, on Twitter over the last few days about this nonsense video that GE released for people who owned a certain light bulb that had firmware that needed to be reset and they had needed to reset it by Welcome starting and by restarting. Smart and tip. This is this is the C by GE smart tip. Had a factory reset 
your GE light bulbs. Go ahead, you can turn the sound on. So. And apps that it's connected to. Yes, he's there a happy two person. Factory reset processes. Okay. Which depend on the generation of bulbs and the firmware you're running on. Okay. Here's the first process. <laughs> yes. Designed for bulbs with this package. Okay. Or for firmware version 2.8. I didn't save the package. Start with your bulb <laughs> off for okay. at least five seconds. Five seconds off. Okay. Honey, can you find the packaging those then bulbs came in? Bulb for eight seconds. Turn it on for eight seconds. Okay. Honey, the packaging, the bulb packaging. Turn off for two seconds. No, I know we threw it out, but I need Turn it because. on for eight seconds. Okay. Wait, oh, what? How many seconds? Oh, no. I've lost track. Turn off for two seconds. Yeah, okay. Wait, wait, okay. <laughs> Turn <laughs> on for eight seconds. <laughs> this is what? This is serious. <laughs> This honey, is like an IT crowd gag. Turn off for two seconds. Bring me my stopwatch, honey. <laughs> turn on for eight <laughs> seconds. By the way, they're not stopping for eight seconds either, are they? Are they? Right. It's right, just no. you can't follow turn the video and do for this. Two seconds. That turn wasn't on for eight <laughs> seconds. <laughs> I can't believe who, it. Who turn coded off this? For two seconds. We're still going. And There's then turn it on one last time. <laughs> one the last. Bob will flash on and off three times <laughs> to show that the reset was successful. If it doesn't, the bulb your flash. bulb Kill may be now. running on an older version of firmware. Oh, exactly. no. You need to try wait, the second more. factory reset process, <laughs> which is designed for C by GE bulbs <laughs> with this package. Honey, can you find that packaging? 2.7 or earlier. Oh, my God. Ready? Okay. Start no with your wonder. Bulb off. For at least five seconds. People think we're nuts. This is why the home. Then this is why home automation. For eight seconds. Is, do you think they wrote code? What did? How did this happen? Turn this off for two seconds. They're just very bad at this. Turn on for two seconds. <laughs> Turn off for two seconds. By the way. Turn on for two completely seconds. coincidentally. This is how Turn you reboot Twit as seconds. well. <laughs> Turn on for two seconds. Oh my god. Turn off for two seconds. Besides how you reboot baby Turn gadgets. on for eight seconds. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Boy. Okay, enough. <laughs> Turn off for two seconds. Oh, I didn't believe Sorry. it when you told me. I had to watch that video. It's a piece of work. Um. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's a... So tech humanist. Is that tech or human? I don't know. <laughs> that is inhumane. It is inhumane. It's yeah. inhumane. <laughs> Maybe that's your next book, Kate. Tech inhumanist. In inhumane tech experiences. Oh. I mean, that'll be the featured experience. Crazy. My goodness. Crazy. So I missed that whole thing because apparently I don't pay close enough attention uh, to Twitter. So I apologize. But now we know the, t the whole story. The, sh the, sh the story I was going to start with is <laughs> I thought kind of interesting, which is uh, Facebook's uh, decision to make their own uh, cryptocurrency, Libra coin. It's, well, uh, Facebook says it's not ours, but it is kind of theirs. I don't think if it were just another cryptocurrency without Facebook's imprimatur, it wouldn't be of any interest. How many cryptocurrencies are there? There are many dozens. Uh, this one has a large group of people behind it besides Facebook, including PayPal and MasterCard and Visa. Uh, no banks, oddly enough. They, they, they've... Facebook open sourced the technology, even though they developed it in-house, and will, according to Wired, cede control of the blockchain to the Neutral Libra Association. The, <laughs> Wired called it the Switzerland of digital coinage because it's in Switzerland. Uh, each of uh, initial the initial 100 founding members, including Facebook, will invest at least $10 million to fund operations and receive interest earned off the reserve... There are some NGO members. Kiva, for instance, the micro lending company, is part of this, and that's what Facebook's pitching this as: is is a way to bring banking to the next billion people. Uh, a way for them not to pay any fees. It's pretty great. Yeah. So, yeah. On, in that regard, it's kind of like Facebook's Internet.org. It seems like a beneficial to humanity thing to do. There was some question about privacy. In other words, would Facebook get caught, get all the transactions? They say no. It'll be private. What is so, Devendra? Why does Facebook want to start a cryptocurrency? 
I mean, it's a big question. I will warn you guys up front. I was off this entire week, so I was just trying to stay away. <laughs> I don't even know. Tech news. I don't even uh, know any. But, but you knew about the it. light bulb. Yeah. I knew about so the light bulb. Well, that's that. just Twitter. That's just fun. <laughs> that's just culture. Uh, but the Facebook cryptocurrency, you know. Well, Doc, you could say this off the top of your head because we don't really yeah. know anything. It's not going to happen until next year. But I think you can speculate that, um, you know, having your cryptocurrency is smart for them because they won't have to pay any transaction fees to, you know, to credit card companies or to banks or anything, which I think most companies want. They they want kind of the freedom to handle payments like that. And also Facebook is so big, you know, it, we've said this many times on the show, it's a, it's bigger than most countries, you know, in terms of the amount of users. So it kind of makes sense for them to have their own specific currency. Actually, uh, it's surprising it took this long. Facebook's bigger than any country. Yeah. If you, if you take the two and a half, what is it, two and a half billion people use Facebook? That's huge. It's huge. Uh, and of course, Facebook Messenger and WhatsApp would clearly, I mean, it's, it strikes me Facebook wants to be WeChat for the rest of the world, right? Because WeChat runs commerce in China. But uh, on the other hand, that Facebook association sticks in some people's craw. Kate, w it's almost like we shouldn't trust anything they say. Yeah, I don't. Like, yeah. <laughs> Clearly, yeah. Uh, uh, Kate, which side do you come? This is a good thing, yeah, or is it oh, an I evil think, plan? I mean, I think there's there's certainly good that can come of it. And I think for whatever good that can come of it, like the banking, the unbanked and, and you know, sort of getting rid of these international transaction fees and, and, and the kinds of things that, that prohibit people from being able to support each other financially across global currencies. Yeah, that, that it makes a lot of sense. But I do think that it's wise of anyone to be suspicious of how it's going to play out with Facebook's reputation for data breaches and overreaches. Not to so mention, they, if you're a bank, <laughs> yeah. this could be terrifying. Uh, a, a threat to national sovereignty, too, because, in fact, India has already banned. You can go to jail for 10 years in India for using any cryptocurrency uh, because it threatens the government, right? They, one of the government's main functions is to create a, and support a currency. Um, so, I mean, one of the, one, I think one of the important um, things here is that these th this this these coins are going to be backed um, by real assets. So it's it's not just um, Bitcoin that can you know that has a sort of a you know a, a cryptographic value as you know ascribed to it and and that's it. This will have money apparently all over the world to back it. They said four current. They said uh, what dollars, euros, yen, and marks. I can't remember what the fourth one was. Yeah, there are no marks. And that's <laughs> <laughs> that's pounds. That's, that's the last one. Yeah. Pounds. <laughs> yeah, we're not. We're we're a bit volatile right now. Thank thank you, Brexit. Brexit. But I think that's um, one of the flaws with Bitcoin for sure. Is you don't know it's now ten thousand dollars again. You don't know what it's going to be worth. Hence, somebody could spend millions of dollars for a pizza, you know, not knowing what that Bitcoin is worth. So that's one thing that I think Facebook wants it. They're not pegging it to the dollar, but they want it to be stable. Yeah, exactly. They, they want it to. They want it to be stable, and and I think the other thing to be to be you know I think we have to be very mindful of is the fact that number one, Facebook has a massive trust issue in the first instance. Anyway, a lot of people are very skeptical of Facebook um, because of its reach. Also, we haven't really had a massively successful use of crypto in the kind of mainstream world you know we've seen companies like dell accept it for payments for laptops and things we've seen stores accept it but we've also seen plenty of stores drop support of it because the volatility is too great yeah. you know there's we i don't think we have a, a massively successful example to say this is mm -hmm. the reason why this can be a success and i think that paired with the lack of trust that facebook inherently has right now makes me very skeptical whether this can take off and that's only magnified by the fact that no banks are involved in this so i think they're going to have a really tough time the, one of the other pro there's really two problems with bitcoin one is the volatility the other is just due to the 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 algorithm for the blockchain transactions could take a really long time and if you're in a store to buy a pair of pants you can't wait half an hour an hour two hours for that transaction to go through it has to go through much faster facebook says that they're going to be able to process tens of thousands of transactions a second but that's not a huge number compared to the potential if this becomes used by billions of customers worldwide. Yeah.
It is interesting that they're trying to keep it open, at least in some respect. Uh, knowing Facebook, like it seems like their first approach to everything, like when they got into VR, Oculus was this closed off thing. It took a while for them to even like cooperate with Steam VR and everything. So the openness from the get go is interesting to me. I just wonder, is it is it like open in name only because Facebook is probably the most, you know, I don't know, powerful force among that open source organization there? Kate, I read too much science fiction, so maybe you can get me <laughs> down to earth. But if you read a lot of science fiction, uh, and and a lot of it talks about corporate governance in the future. That'll be there won't be countries. There'll be corporations. And you're looking in our current affairs for the seeds of that future. This to me is could be in 20, 30, 40 years. We might look back and say this was a watershed moment when Silicon Valley decided screw dollars. We're going to use our own currency. Yeah, I, I think that's true. I think there's a there are sort of um, shades of that going on, and I think there's a, enough a, enough going on that that Facebook and its its partners tried to put into place to alleviate some of those doubts and concerns. Right. You know, certainly this uh, consortium of 28 or whatever partners uh, do do look like the kind of partners that you would want to have involved in this process. As you mentioned, Kiva and other NGOs that that sort of provide this kind of stabilizing humanistic force to the whole thing. Uh, but I do think that the association with, with Facebook is just going to be really hard to overcome that, that there's no sense that anybody's going to have that, that this is not a play to monetize the back end of, of, uh, messaging and the, the content that Facebook is increasingly pushing to the dark corners of its platform, where people are going to be clustered in groups and and that sort of thing is going to need some sort of of reach, uh, some sort of monetization. Uh, this seems like a way to to get around uh, having monetization through the, the newsfeed ad advertising in the newsfeed, and uh, it does seem like they're 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 sort of thinking two steps ahead to to get to where they're uh, diversified and and well set up for for continued leadership and sprawl. This is completely weirdly paranoid of me, but I can just imagine, I, I thought two years ago, Mark Zuckerberg, especially with his 50 state tour, he was going to run for president. I thought he thought, <laughs> and I think this is kind of the, I could see the Silicon Valley billionaires thinking, and, and well, not just Silicon Valley, Jeff Bezos thinking, you know, <laughs> this democracy thing, this is a, this is a mess. We <laughs> just let us, we know we're smart. We could figure this yeah. out. Let's just let us do it. Uh, Make I think it more efficient. Yeah. It'd be more efficient. Uh, let's let us handle it. And then I obviously Zuck realized after he went to Congress and people thought he was a robot. Okay, maybe I'm not going to make it. <laughs> I couldn't become president. But who, you know, why would I want to take a step down? I don't need to be president. I'm CEO. Bitch. I could. <laughs> all I need is a currency. I mean, seriously, this is uh, what if global coin? What if Libra became the? I could see how it would. There's no if there's no vig going to the banks, it became a a dominant form of payment. It's how you do internet. I we use PayPal. We have international hosts. We you, we have to use. It's easier for us to use PayPal to yeah. pay them. The PayPal support is interesting on this. Yeah, too. yeah for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure there's enough revenue to go around. I'm sure they'll figure out a way to get something out of it. But the, but to me, this doesn't strike me from at least certainly from Facebook's point of view as either a play a economic play like we're going to make oh we're going to make a lot of money on this although they might have a hand in every transaction going forward that's amazon's plan right and i don't think this is a privacy thing i think that's missing the whole point of this if you say oh facebook's just doing this so they can get more information about all our transactions i think this is a power play i think this is facebook mm -hmm. saying who needs a government who needs banks am i just being I paranoid devendra no, I think I think that's probably a good way to look at it. It's it to me it's a little less scary than something like the portal that they, you know, announced their video chat system. <laughs> uh, and I should point out I have two and yeah. I have two of them which and because oh, come on, Leo. I come well, on. I thought I need two, one to talk to the other one. <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. I mean, which is good tech, but probably came at the wrong time for them. Whereas this, like, yeah, it does seem like a power play. It does seem like, how can we just be a global superpower? What if we, yeah, what if we didn't need banks? What if we could just manage our own ecosystem? You know, it's preparing us for the world of the future where we're all living in VR and just buying stuff digitally. <laughs> it, it all makes sense. Yeah. And I guess I'm not the only one who's paranoid because uh, the French government has already said we're investigating 
And Facebook is going to have to go to Congress next month to explain <laughs> explain yourself, Facebook, um, because there's some, I think, reasonable concern in government about, well, what is Facebook up to? So maybe I'm not completely paranoid. Although lately I mean, getting, no, no. getting grilled by Congress is just kind of <laughs> it's table stakes for anybody who wants to play this game. Yeah, I thought it was interesting on that uh, the Congress investigation uh, articles that I've been reading that it's uh, both it, it's a sort of a bipartisan suspicion of this plan, right? And you can you can easily see what what in what sort of um, uh, stakes that each side is thinking about. One side's thinking about the sort of social and data privacy implications, right. and one side is thinking about, but banks, right? <laughs> you know, right. Don't go stepping in and taking over banks. So it, it is interesting that it is, it is a bipartisan concern that's that's uh, being expressed here. If you think about banks, not just uh, central banks, uh, national banks, but just bank, you know, commercial banks. Uh, they really are an important constituency to Congress, I would imagine. They spend a lot of money on Congress. Congress has yeah. a certain sense of responsibility uh, to banks, and I'm sure that's what some of this is. And 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 honestly, I I so I'm so torn about this because, as you probably gathered, I'm not a fan of Facebook. But at the same time, anything that disintermediates, especially banks. Uh, I think that's a good thing. <laughs> so I don't know what where to come down on this one. Well, it, it's so easy too to to sort of fast forward a few years and imagine that you know the kind of investigation that's been going on over the last couple of years about the Russian involvement in uh, the 2016 presidential election and the campaigns. Uh, it's so easy to imagine a couple of years down the road, this whole obfuscation that happens right. as a result of this all happening through Swiss bank. And with, uh, you know, there's some data trail, of course, imagine that what yeah. data trail instead yeah, of, I mean, instead of subpoenaing Deutsche bank, yeah. <laughs> who are you going to subpoena if it's a Libra coin? Yeah, that is a real concern. This would be a money launderer's dream. We, well, Can I just throw one other massive bit of skepticism in here? And yes, I feel please. like a massive, a massive naysayer on all this. No, but no, that's good. Have we, like, have we really examined why Facebook is doing this? Right, because Facebook gets about ninety nine percent of its all its revenue from advertising, and it, we know how that side of its business model works. But what is its real motivation here? Like, I've heard talk about that the more people who have better access to money and banking and 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 you know revenue in general mean they may be more likely to want to spend on advertising and therefore that's good for Facebook. And I get that if that's the reason. But I, I, I maybe it's just my inherent distrust for most of what Facebook does that makes me just want to question why exactly is it doing this? And why is Facebook the right company to do to do this and to pull this off? What has it been telling other partners about why it's the right one to spearhead all this? It, you know, amidst all this stuff that's going on with Facebook, why now and why Facebook? I don't have a good answer for that. It's a it's a question I sort of pose to to everyone else. Um, I just I find myself to be maybe more skeptical than some other people I've heard talking about this. Um, I'm not sure why that is. No, it's the same yeah. thing as uh, what Facebook said. Let's do Internet.org. Uh, we want to, you know, oh, this is a wonderful thing. We're going to give the Internet to uh, the next billion people who don't have access to the Internet. Mm -hmm. And then it turns mm -hmm. out for them, the Internet means Facebook. Uh, and India, very interestingly, said uh, this is this is a, just another form of colonialism. We have plenty of experience with that. No, thank you. Yeah. Yep. And, yeah, pretty much. and if you look at if you look at something that's happening with WhatsApp, which Facebook owns, you know, WhatsApp um, wants to be more of a business to consumer operation. You know, it wants to have a business model around. Well, this is the place you can go for real time chat between between, a uh, you know, a subscriber and the company being subscribed to. It wouldn't take a giant leap of imagination to think that this it could be built into something like that, where actually you can do your transactions on this platform, you can send and receive money on this platform. And maybe there would be an incentive to Facebook for you to do that. Plus, it wouldn't necessarily cost Facebook anything to do that, you know, on an individual transaction basis. And I, mm -hmm. I, I wonder if that's part of the long term ambition here. Yeah, it's I mean, it's yeah. a lot of speculation. But I feel what you're saying, Leo, that it seems it's hard not to feel like there's a conspiracy here. And I think 
it's not just Facebook, right? They have a ton of partners and it feels like them working together with all these other technology companies and a lot of VC firms, you know, Andreessen Horowitz, uh, Union Square Ventures. I'm just looking at the list here. Like, well, uh, OK, but VC be, firms, yeah, they're they're just covering their bets. If anybody, oh, yeah. you know, a yeah. VC firm says, yeah, yeah, we'll give you 10 million. It's it's pocket change. And we just want to make exactly. sure if that's the next big thing that we're here. I don't think that yeah, that's yeah, a yeah. vote of confidence. It's just a, you know, hedging our bets. No, I, I yeah, I, I haven't really seen them jump into a lot of digital currencies, even though it's like the the big hot thing now. Right. It just seems like this is a really interesting group of people. Right. So, well, yeah, right. if Facebook weren't yeah. involved. Yep. Yep. We wouldn't be talking about it. It would just be exactly. another coin. Yeah, this seems like the beginning of like the the ultimate digital currency, basically. And they have these VC firms. They have Stripe, which is you know a company that's handling credit card transactions for a lot of uh, you know online companies and things like that. Uh, and PayPal, which we mentioned before, which is still big, even though it seems like an old school company. They're still huge. Uh, they have Venmo. Like there there's a lot of there's a lot of really interesting partnership here that I think could, uh, it's more interesting than just Facebook doing this on their own, basically. Well, I, I think one of the things that makes it interesting is not mm -hmm. only that it, Facebook's name is is part of this collective, but that Facebook has been kind of the name that we've associated with this idea for the last few weeks as the rumors have been flying around. And, right. and that also they're building the Calibra wallet that's going to be at least initially the way, the way that you you sort of manage the money and and push things around so it will supposedly that there will be third parties that will that will build wallets other than Calibra but i think that's an interesting function at the beginning too and i still come back to for me, I just see Facebook looking into, into their own future and seeing that they're going to need to fundamentally turn their business model kind of inside out in order to deal with all of the complaints about content moderation and all the complaints that they're getting about regulation and, and data privacy. Their, their content that's been pushed to the news feed is going to need to be pulled back into the, the groups and private messaging. And so they need to think uh, in a completely different way about how they monetize that and how they how they make that a successful model going forward. And to me, this just feels like one piece of that equation. <laughs> it might boil down to, and Nate, you ask an interesting question, but I think a fairly impenetrable question, what is their intent? No, I mean, mm. I don't know if you can look into Facebook's soul and see what its intent is for anything. <laughs> Well, but they've already helped Facebook us create has democracy. a soul. Yeah. Facebook has no soul. That's the point. <laughs> it's got the dark, soulless eyes of a man-eating shark. You, mm. But no, it's, in all seriousness, uh, it kind of, kind of comes down to how you feel about Facebook. If you think Facebook is, uh, if you true to what Mark says all the time, which is it's all about connection, man. Uh, this would be just one another way to do that, right? Uh, and disintermediating banks and governments, eh, that couldn't be bad. Um, but maybe it's also about getting a piece of every financial transaction in the future. And the other question is, if not Facebook, who, if Google did this, would we be having the same conversation? You bet. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and if not Facebook, China, I mean, I'm sure that there are other people trying to do this. So maybe yeah. Facebook is the best possible choice to do this. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Fundamentally, there's, I don't know how different it is for Facebook to be doing this from China doing this. In, in some ways, I mean, there's still a, a lot of surveillance that kind of goes into the equation. And, you know, the amount of trust on the table is still just as much in question. <sighs> I don't know. If it were a choice between China and Facebook, now you got me. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'd choose Facebook. Yeah, yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe this, maybe this is the future of Facebook, right? I mean, it's still a really young company, and in in fifty years' time, if Facebook's still around, and somebody came back from the future and said Facebook is the global standard for international borderless payments, I could, say, and that's it, like you know, like a massive one world bank, I could believe it. I mean, you look at a company yeah. like Nokia, which is my favorite example. It used to make toilet paper. Yeah. And then it decades and then later tires. And <laughs> tires and bits of rubber and stuff. Like yeah. if someone came back in from two thousand and three and, and said to this person buying Nokia toilet paper that in the future it was gonna make most of the world's smartphones, you'd be like, hmm, how? Not sure. Uh maybe Facebook can do that. I don't know, but I'm skeptical for now. 
It's a fa- I just think it's a fascinating subject, and it feels to me like a watershed moment, and it might end up not being. But it feels like this will be, this could be uh, a moment you'd look back in time and say, yeah, that's when, uh, that's when Facebook started to take over. <laughs> oh, God. That's when? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> fascinating uh, subject. Yeah, Facebook is in, in a lot of heat, of course. The latest from Casey Newton, who does such a good job, he's once again blowing the lid off uh, moderation on Facebook, his article uh, on The Verge, talking about uh, the Tampa content moderators. And what a nightmare. First of all, I think an important thing to point out is that it, they don't work for Facebook. They work for a contractor called Cognizant, who has a $200 million deal with Facebook for two years to hire and deploy these uh, content moderators. It's, it sounds like a nightmare job. Uh, Casey got, once again, got a number of uh, current and former moderators to talk to him about what's going on there. And it just, it's just depressing as hell. Uh, conditions, uh, he, he reported first on, on the Phoenix site, uh, which is how he got entree into the Tampa site. He said, conditions at the Phoenix site have not improved since I visited. Last week, some employees were sent home after an infestation of bed bugs was discovered in the in the office the second time that's happened uh cognizance statement they also run the phoenix office was well bed bugs can be found in virtually every place people tend to gather <laughs> including the workplace <laughs> i don't think we've ever had have we ever had bed bugs here uh no no bed bugs <laughs> here they're naturally recurring pests you know <laughs> You get it anywhere. Oh my God! I mean, the the <laughs> stories that he had, they described. This is uh, Tampa. Contractors told me that Cognizant had lured them away. This is the thing that's really depressing. From less demanding jobs by promising regular schedules, bonuses, and career development. None of that. All of that uh, they reneged on. Contractors described a filthy workplace in which they regularly find pubic hair and other bodily waste at their workstations. <sighs> Employees said managers laugh off or ignore sexual harassment and threats of violence. The use of marijuana is so prevalent, a manager joked at an all-hands meeting he'd gotten a contact high walking in the door. Um, and you know what? I don't blame him for getting high because what a crappy job. And <laughs> he talked to one guy who uh, saw a video. Uh, it was asked to review a video of a horrific animal abuse. The guy who was a dog lover couldn't take it. He he flagged it. Facebook said, no, no, that's okay. We're going to let it through. At which point that video got reshared and the poor moderator had to see it again and again and again and again for $15 an hour, which I should point out is almost twice the minimum wage in Florida. Um, they kept reposting it again and again, he said, pounding the table as he spoke. It made me so angry. I had to listen to its screams all day. I don't know what there is to say about this. I mean, this is part of the problem. Facebook and, and, and all of Silicon Valley, Google too, tends to say, oh, no, there's technological solutions to obviously, you know, when you have a giant platform as we do, people are people. Some people are going to misbehave. There's technological solutions. There's AI solutions. But it seems like that they just hire more people. 30,000 people now work for Facebook in content moderation, which sounds like one of the worst jobs I can oh, yeah. imagine. Yeah, there, there's an episode of uh, HBO's Chernobyl of the people whose job it is to go and uh, just, just kill all the irradiated pets. Yes. Spoilers, I guess, but you know, one of the worst jobs I can imagine. And this this seems like the modern equivalent of that, basically, yeah. like having to live through this sort of content. And it's not like they can just skip it, right? They're required to watch, I think, like 15 to 20 seconds of these videos just to make sure, you know, that they're flagging it appropriately. So uh, this is a thankless job, but it also goes to show like, all these tech companies, uh, they talk about the holy algorithm right. that could fix this eventually. It, it's never, not really going to happen anytime soon. So right now it's all human help. And they farm out this stuff to these contract companies, which uh, which just don't care, right? They, they have a really low level of employee care and it, they're separated by Facebook and Google. Like, it, yeah, yeah, you don't even it, really it, work for Facebook. It's a shame. You know, you're yep, yeah, exactly. Yeah. What an, oh, just an awful, uh, sad thing. And I, you know, that doesn't, I don't know if there's anything to say about this. I can't, I don't know if you can even really blame Facebook, although 
what are they making? Fifteen billion dollars a quarter, something well, like yeah, that. I, yeah, I think you can blame them a little for <laughs> yeah. for not putting the conditions in place that uh, even through a contractor that uh, are livable, manageable conditions. These are horrible jobs. They're doing horrible work, but at least the workplace that they're in could be something that yeah. that is not disgusting, and they could be pe- being provided with competent psychiatric help, which it sounds like they're not. Nope. Uh, they could. Be, I mean, there's there's just any number of of, of opportunities that Facebook has to make this situation better through its contractor, uh, and, and it's it's not it's not Facebook's fault per se. It's not Cognizant's fault per se. It's that the scale of the content problem is so vast uh, that they really need to double down and triple down on on the resources they're throwing at this. Uh, and I hope that they are. It sounds like the the person they have now. Uh, in charge of this at Facebook is looking to do some earnest improvements uh, over the situation. And I really hope he's effective, but it's complicated. It's very complicated. And you saw, you see in this uh, one line in here that one of the the people that um, Casey Newton interviews says, I asked him what he thought needed to change. He says, I think Facebook needs to shut down. Wow. And uh, Yeah. Well, I guess it does raise the question. I'm sure you talk about this uh, in your work, uh, Kate, that, is it possible to have a social network that doesn't descend into nightmarish hell? It's, I don't know if it's possible. I do know that a lot of people have already been down this road in the academic landscape and have uh, evaluated what happens when we're uh, given the the benefit of quasi-anonymity and the reach that, that we're given in, in these platforms and what happens when you try to moderate that. And there, it's just... It's all levels of complexity happening at the same time. So it, it sort of feeds into the best and the worst of human nature. Um, and, and it's it's hard. So I think, you know, it kind of brings up this quote that Tim Cook said this week or last week about, you know, if you if you build a chaos factory, you can't not be responsible for the chaos or however he said it. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, and, yeah. Yeah. You, you have to be responsible for this. Uh, Facebook has to be responsible for the chaos that's been unleashed. And they're certainly benefiting from it. They have enough resources. You know, this is this is their opportunity to step up and, and really make something good happen here. Yeah. Or better than as bad as it is. It just rem- it reminds me a lot of the uh, stories we heard about Amazon warehouse workers. Uh, it mm-hmm. just feels like this is this is kind of the modern world we live in. Uh, mm-hmm. And I feel bad for our, our kids. I really do. Um, well, so much I mean, good comes of, of these platforms. That's true too. We can't ignore that. So much good. Uh, it's it's just that there's there's a lot of complications that arise out of it, and people are the collateral damage. And we, we need to do something about that. Facebook needs to do something about that. Regulations perhaps need to do something about that. It's it's something very complicated that needs to be un, unwoven and figured out at a, at a level at a level that has not been solved before as we, as you guys have talked about yeah. it's the biggest company it's the it represents yeah. a, a, a kind of a country so we need to be thinking on that scale with these solutions and with all due respect to Tim Cook but Apple's had its own uh, problems with contract workers in in sure. China mm-hmm. uh, I, I it feels like Apple's tried to do something about it whether they've done so successfully I can't be sure but uh, yeah, you got to take responsibility for it. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, I don't know. What it's to, something I think Twitter is learning too. I mean, it's certainly not as if Twitter doesn't have its share of trolls and bots and right. all kinds of you know disinformation and and nut, nuttiness that happens on that platform. It's just the nature of having that kind of scale and reach, and you know, people uh, using it to to good advantages and bad advantages. Yeah. So they need yeah. to be doing something uh, to, to moderate that yeah. for sure. Yeah. Taking responsibility definitely seems like the good first step. And I think for the past years, even that much, even getting that far seemed impossible because these companies just wouldn't listen to a lot of the complaints or would say like, oh yeah, we have algorithms dealing with this or something like that. So at least now it seems more like Facebook, Twitter, Facebook at least is looking a little more at like what it's doing. I'm sure I'm thinking like that whole Zuckerberg 50 state reunion or 50 state tour. Uh, maybe it was about a potential presidential run, but it also seemed like what did we do? Like, how did Facebook <laughs> affect the 2016 election? You know, how did we break this democracy or how did we basically help to Have break they it? Have ever in admitted way? that they broke democracy, though? I don't I don't think so, don't even think though we know about like yeah, not Russian troll farms yeah. and everything. Yeah, yeah. No, certainly not like that. But 
I think that tour alone showed a certain amount of responsibilities. Like maybe I have this thing that is so, you know, has so greatly influenced this country. I should go see how that's happened um, with these sorts of things. These, you know, these contract farms basically seem like uh, these are labor practices that we've been talking about for years um for oh, yeah. all sorts of things even oh, before yeah. tech and it's just the basics that we can't get down and it's a problem inherent in america too like we just don't we don't treat our workers that well and certainly everybody's looking at their bottom line and they want the cheapest easiest solution that's kind of a bigger thing we need to work through as a society to really fix it for all these tech companies too i don't want to i i i feel like uh last couple of years <laughs> I've, I've, we've all, I've focused at least a twit on the, on the, on the dystopia that we're creating. And I don't want to imply that there isn't so many wonderful and good things uh, coming of it. Um, it's, it's just that it's hard to miss the scary things that are also happening. Yeah, because they're getting bigger. They're bigger and more impactful than ever, you know, so it's hard to avoid that. Well, it's clear that because technology, you know, when I started doing this, technology was a little back alley. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't, <laughs> like life it was just the nerds gathering to build their little z80 machines it wasn't a it wasn't a it wasn't important it was fun it was cool it was a hobby it was the toy store but now as technology is directly woven into the fabric of everything we do uh these these bigger issues have emerged you know when you're you know typing in a uh, yeah. checkbook program in basic you don't it doesn't <laughs> none of this comes up it doesn't it's not an issue we have deeper like non-technical problems to right. solve now so yeah right. that philosophy degree may come in handy it certainly has well, for like dealing with writing about yeah. this stuff yeah well so that's interesting because Devendra you too I mean when you start when you started doing this you were covering fun stuff yeah I'm all Fun stuff, certainly. Like when I got into tech, uh, honestly, Leo, by watching you guys and tech TV, all that stuff back then. It was in the still day, fun back then. It was so much fun. It was just exciting. But tech, you know, I think over the past decade, tech has won, certainly in certain respects, like yeah. in terms of being the dominant culture, uh, being the dominant business culture, um, it pervading consumer lives. Like tech is, we all revolve our lives around tech now in so many ways, even if people don't think about that. And yeah now is the time to stop and think about like the human cost all that so that's why i like the tech humanist angle it's certainly great um Thanks. but yeah these companies need to think a lot harder in general yeah i kind of want to go back to the days of talking about how to install uh you know red hat linux on a, <laughs> a p90 <laughs> processor yeah. it was just it was a simpler simpler time. times it's a simpler <laughs> time I think there's still a lot of fun to be had around that stuff. I do think that, you know, people like Devinder who have the philosophy background and a, a lot of other folks who are bringing, you know, the liberal arts discussions into into tech are, are bringing a lot of value because a, a lot of what happened with the playing around with the toys of tech, I think, sort of disambiguated it or, you know, it, it sort of divorced it from the reality of what happens at scale with this stuff. And I think that's part of why we're facing these consequences now is that we've we've looked at technology as eh, it's just fun, you know, and then it and then it's taken on scale that has impacted our lives in very real ways. So it, it takes people coming in with that philosophy background, with the ethics backgrounds, with the, you know, the rigor of looking at the human condition across society and culture and saying, you know, how do we make this where it actually is, does have the potential to use the powers of emerging technologies of, of automation and the scale of AI and all of that to, to actually make human life better, to solve things like climate catastrophe through the powers of AI. And I think that all is still possible and we can harness that. That's why uh, you're on the show, Kate. <laughs> Yay. Seriously, because I need somebody, I need a coach to say it's going to be okay. <laughs> Kate didn't read science fiction as a kid. She studied German in college and she believes, still believes in humanity. <laughs> I think it's, I don't want to say it's going to be okay. I think it's only going to be okay if we do the work. Okay. You know, so that's what we got to do. Yeah. Yeah, we got we got to do that. I would say a lot of science fiction does teach the humanity thing. Like, I oh, think it does. I was teasing. Yeah, like but, reading Asimov or something. Yeah. Like, it's it is all about the potential for this stuff to be good, but uh, deep down, it's it's the human story coming out. Basically, that's yeah. important. The yeah. best science fiction is is not uh, it's not about machines and robots. It's about people. Yeah, yeah I mm -hmm. agree with you. Um, and I also agree with Kate that we need more human in our tech. And uh, yeah. so it, please inject that into the show at any point, <laughs> any point you can, you can think of. Uh, Devendra Hardwar is here. He's senior editor at Engadget. Kate O'Neill, her book Tech Humanist 
is great and was the subject of a recent uh, triangulation with Denise Howell. If you get a chance to listen to it, please do. And, of course, Nate Langston, who is here from Bloomberg and uh, is trying to stay awake. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's the middle of the night in the UK. Our show today brought to you by Captera, my friends. I had a caller. What was it? We called the radio show yesterday saying, uh, I'm working for an association. We need software to keep track of our associates and their accounts. And, and I said, I don't know, but you know where? I know you can go. And I was able to give a nice little plug for our sponsor, Captera. Don't call me if you need business software. Don't Google it if you need business software. There's a directory online that has every business program out there organized into 700 specific categories, obvious stuff like email marketing, CMS, IT service, SEO, workflow management, direct line of business stuff like veterinary office management or yoga studio management. Every program, modern software, so if you're suffering with something written for Windows 95, you can move to something that really suits, that works well, that doesn't require you to use Internet Explorer 8 or <laughs> or Vista, uh, it's at Captera, captera.com slash twit. And what I love is Captera, we've been kind of counting down uh, over the last few months. They're getting very close now to 1 million reviews. They get about 1,000 new reviews every single day. Actual software users, they're very careful. They vet the reviews. So when you look for software in Captera, Here's dry cleaning, software to run a dry cleaning establishment. First, you're going to find every program that does that. You can then narrow it down by ratings, by what, how it works, whether it's on-premises or on your hard drive or in the cloud, and how many, how many, if it, does it handle bookkeeping, what, what does it do? Narrow it down, set up a comparison chart side-by-side, uh, side, and then read the reviews because the reviews are so valuable. With, with 30,000 fresh reviews every month, you know that there's going to be somebody whose reviews starch up starch up what a good name for dry cleaning so starch up and it is going to say that's actually look at that five star reviews that's this is the bro man if i were going to start a dry cleaners i would use starch up see now how much would you pay for this service it's free that's the thing that blows me away i always bury the lead by accident this is a free service captera believes software can make the world a better place because it can help every organization become a more efficient effective version of itself Captera is software selection simplified. And if you need software for your business, captera.com slash twit. C-A-P-T-E-R-R-A. Captera.com slash twit. Thank you, Captera, for, for making a great site with really useful stuff. And thank you for using that URL and letting them know you heard it here. Captera.com slash twit. Software selection simplified. Josh Hawley. Senator from, uh, uh, where's, is he Idaho? Where's Josh from? Missouri. Uh, has finally presented a, a legislation that will rid Facebook, Google, and Twitter of suspected political bias by stripping away the protections uh, all internet service uh, providers have from the uh, Section 230 of the uh, Communications Decency Act. Section 230 says that Internet publishers distribute con anything that distributes content supplied by users, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, is not liable for that content. Harley, Har Harley wants him to be liable because he thinks they're biased against conservatives. That, by the way, uh, is obviously a red herring. But it's terrifying to think uh, that 230 could be eliminated. There are those, including the EFF, who say you eliminate Section 230. If you make platforms responsible for the content on those platforms, you eliminate the Internet. Nobody's ever said Ma Bell should be responsible for the content of phone calls. That would be impossible. Section 230 says that Internet providers, uh, online services, are like the phone company. Holly wants to change all that. I don't think it has a chance, but it is it is being introduced in the Senate, which means it has a, a decent chance of at least getting through the Senate. Um, not not a good idea. Um, and I think as much as we talk about how scary Facebook is and how what a dumpster fire Twitter has become 
Nobody wants uh, 230 to be overturned. Mike Masnick has a really uh, good piece, uh, as usual, on Tech Dirt. And let me see if I can find that. I bookmarked it. In which uh, he says, once more with feeling, there's no legal distinction between a platform and a publisher. And I've, I want to mention this because I have fallen prey to this notion that uh, Facebook, for instance, can't decide if it's a platform or a publisher. A platform would not be responsible. A publisher would, like a magazine would. He says, Section 230 says that any online platform, any internet platform is protected. There's no need to distinguish between platform or publisher. In fact, there is no special distinction for platforms. It makes no difference, Masnick writes, how an internet company refers to itself. All that matters is they meet the legal definition of an interactive computer service, which if they're online, the answer is generally yes, to be protected. So uh, I want to apologize for conf maybe cause, causing some more confusion about that than necessary. There is no distinction. They are protected by 230, and the assault has begun. It's actually in Europe, I think. Tell me, tell me, Nate, I can't... I, the, the, this new European uh, Intellectual Property Act did pass, right? But each nation has I'll be to... Honest. I, I'll be honest. I haven't been keeping my finger on the uh, on the European side. You're you're Brexited already. You're out of there, huh? You're gone. Well, if only, yeah. <laughs> well, no. I mean, not if only. If only this wouldn't have happened in the first place. But um, no, we're still we're still delayed on on that front. So yeah. we're, whatever whatever Europe has has passed, I'm sure we are still subject to. And in general, uh, with most of the European laws, when we do finally leave, we're just going to invoke them as our own anyway. Right. So there's two articles, Article 11 and Article 13. Actually, they yeah. just got renumbered just to make it hard to figure out what's going on to 15 and yeah, 17. These, these ones, these ones, yeah, these ones did did pass. These are the ones that people are calling the, you know, the, the war on memes or, um, right. or things like that. The, and the, the war you know, on snippets, that, too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and really kind of a war on, uh, the same kind of war is happening in the U.S. with this... Uh, attack on an article on uh, 230 section 230 so okay i'm just bringing it up obviously none of you care you just just <laughs> blithely going along with your day how about this this is just going to add fuel to the fire the knitting site ravelry announced just earlier today that they are going to ban ravelry is a site my mom uses ravelry where you can get knitting designs she you know, you could share, you could say a forum where you could share, you know, knitting stories. They're going to ban users that show Trump's support because they say that's support for white supremacy. We cannot, the state, let's, let's go to the site statement just to, just to show it. <laughs> New policy. Do not post in support of Trump or his administration. We're banning support of Donald Trump and his administration on Ravelry. Posts, projects, patterns, profiles, no more Make America Great knitted hats we're not going to delete your project but we could ban you we don't want to prov we want to provide a space that's inclusive of all and we feel that that's not doing it what do you say this just this just I've, is fuel to the josh holly fire <laughs> because this is such a ravelry is a huge publisher of uh <laughs> of content i guess i don't know um, it, it is funny how I feel like the conservative argument always is like, you know, free speech, everyone's free to do what they want. Um, but like once, yeah, once a conservative voice is, is kind of squashed in a way or limited, like it's, it's instantly censorship. I don't know. It, it just seems confusing. This seems like a big <laughs> step though. I'm surprised a, a knitting site of all places is the first to kind of make this leap because it's something people have been calling for on Twitter for a while. Yeah. Um, I think I wonder if this is a response to like all the more recent reports of, uh, you know, the the immigrant detention centers uh, in Texas and the horrid conditions there and the things kids have to live through, uh, you know, under this administration. Like it's it's horrific. It's not great. I could I think it's not that controversial to describe it as like a racist policy against a certain group of people. Uh, there was a whole hubbub last week around calling them concentration camps and uh, what else would you call them? Right. I don't know. Uh, right. But yeah, th this seems like a, a controversial move, but I want to see what happens after this if other people follow suit. Yeah, they, they say in the their statement, 
we cannot provide a space that's inclusive of all and also su- allow support for open white supremacy. Yep. And then they go on to note, we're not endorsing Democrats nor banning Republicans. We're definitely not banning conservative politics, et cetera, et cetera. But it seems to me that's not going to be understood that way. <laughs> I, I, I think this is, I'm personally, you know, on a very personal politics level in support of this idea and I'm all for it. And if, of course it, it's, it's a private corporation, a private uh, forum so they can, they can do this. Uh, and I, I think that there's this whole uh, intolerance idea that, that goes beyond this discussion, but yep. the, yeah, that the, 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 you don't have to tolerate intolerance. That's not part of, of um, allowing for uh, open exchange of ideas. But even having said that, I guess what I'm what I'm getting back to is they're not going to convince people who feel attacked by this uh, decision that they're not banning conservative politics and they're not endorsing Democrats or banning Republicans. So this is it's going to be tricky, I think, to get the the nuance across here uh, that it's really just about keeping that support of open white supremacy out of their platform. Uh, it feels they like have that's every going right to be hard to, to get across. They have every yeah. right to do this. And because they're a knitting site, I think probably they'll get away with it. But but Twitter has every right to do it as well. It, in fact, they've been accused of doing it. I don't think they are, but they've been accused of doing it by conservatives. They've only recently started to like really clamp down on some like Nazi accounts and things. Yeah, things if you're a Nazi, you've racist, got a nice yeah. home there at Twitter. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but now it's all semantics because then what do you yeah what do you call an administration that is yeah putting people in cages and yeah concentrating certain types of people into, into a camp like yeah, environment a camp like environment yeah <laughs> yeah mm. i don't know what you call that no. so yeah a lot of this is semantics i think i feel bad because in in, in one respect i don't think we'll ever come to uh, we can never again come to a national consensus about anything if everything becomes so polarized if nobody's allowed to say anything you know if like i only want to hear speech that i agree with that eliminates the chance for a uh, consensus of any kind or any rapprochement at all. I, just, I, I totally hear you, Leo. I totally hear you. But it's like, I, I do feel like who who cast the first stone here, right? Who Who is the one who like took things so far that you can't even negotiate or have a conversation about what their beliefs are? And I think for me personally, it is certainly like the Trump administration and kind of what yeah. they're doing to this country. So I, I yeah, I can't, it's hard to have a conversation with somebody who supports Trump. And then, yeah, I couldn't really consider them friends, you know, because yeah. of what they support, basically. So, Kate, yeah. if uh, Twitter does the mm -hmm. same thing, what what would people, what would you say? I think it's it would be just as complicated in terms of the, um, the how it's received by people broadly. Uh, obviously, any decision is going to be received well by those who align with it and like it's an attack by those who don't. But I think that the idea that they're allowing um, basically Nazi uh, participation and, and the amplification. <laughs> but these are knitters. What are they? Are they? Is. I mean, are they saying no swastikas? I mean, that would be reasonable. I, yeah, I, I suspect that there is an awful lot of stuff going on in their forums and that Must there are be. patterns going around that are yeah. all about supporting Trump and, and um, the Nazi flag or, you know, symbols and, and things like that. Uh, well, we don't know, is, and it may well be they've been trolled um, by non-knitters. I mean, this happens all the time, right? Uh, Who have decided, let's attack Ravelry. For, for all I know, that's yeah. what this is in response to. yeah. I think for what I see happening or what I would see happening, you, you asked if, if it happened on Twitter, if this yeah. kind of decision happened on Twitter. I think, you know, you, you I think you would see an awful lot of people who would conflate that decision with an attack on, you know, conservative politics. Right. And I think that's really unfortunate. I think to your point that there's there's a, um, a lack of nuance and there's a lack of uh of willingness to see sort of the the differences of opinion and and just kind of I, uh, assume that everything that falls into one camp, so to speak, is all bad or all good. It's it's way too uh, too lacking in nuance in in the discussions that we're having. So it's a shame, but I I I think it's a really really respectable effort on on Ravelry's part to say this is specifically that we don't want to allow 
uh, support of an administration that is support for white supremacy. And we want to call out that that's not about blanket banning of conservative politics and so on. It's just I don't really buy that that's how that's going to be received when it comes down to it. Yeah. Wow. Of course, it's a little more complicated on Twitter because if you did that, you'd also have to ban Twitter's number one user, who happens to be the president of the United States. Uh, what's amazing to me, and, and I guess it, it, you can't say it started with President Trump, but it is certainly uh, a big part of it is due to President Trump, who has essentially used Twitter as a way to make announcements, is that more and more companies, politicians, just people in general are using Twitter to make announcements. It's become... It's become the place you announce this stuff, which is kind of shocking to me because I always think of Twitter as a place you do offhanded stuff instead of making major, you know, presidential proclamations. What is going on? Yeah, but I think that that changed uh, through even the um, uh, the protests in Egypt. And, uh, you know, I think we saw the the role of Twitter change in society over the last decade. You know, It, it became a very important medium for very prominent social discussions and, and cultural conversations. Do you think, uh, so do you think the next president, if it's not, let's say wh- whenever president Trump's out of office, if the next president will continue to use Twitter as a platform to make uh, public announcements? Yeah, I think so. I think that horse is out of the barn for sure. That's done. Yeah. That, mm-hmm. Wow. It's, it's going to be an important platform going forward for sure. Or at least have somebody, you know, on staff who kind of knows the platform because we're looking at this uh, after who is after AOC started doing those great Instagram lives that are so relaxed and also breaking right. down complex policy. Everybody started copying her and trying to do it, too. Um, so, so in a way, yeah. it's the fireside chat, which Roosevelt uh, uh, introduced. It's exactly, the fireside yeah. chat of this generation is social yeah. media, not just Twitter, but t- Instagram, Twitter. The next president might make uh, make her announcements on Instagram. Mm-hmm. And maybe I think, I put- think the, other, the other angle to this is that, you know, Trump, as much as he he likes to hate on a lot of media, um, he knows the power of the media. He knows media. And I think yeah. that the, uh, the use of Twitter and the immediacy of Twitter gives him, you know, he knows that it's going to get straight into the papers, straight onto the websites and the blogs, you know, unfiltered. And and that's kind of what he wants, I think. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. Interesting. It's a savvy strategy. And it is direct. I mean, this is the, I mean, didn't we want to have uh, uh, disinterme- disinter- wasn't inter- internet about disintermediation? Didn't we want to have disintermediated communication with our leaders? And isn't that what Twitter is giving us? directly one-sided is a bit too one-sided yeah. you know yeah. I, I don't see him replying well, very often no but the courts by the way said that he can't block you because right. if he's going to use it as a platform he can't block anybody everybody has to have a right to respond i doubt very much president trump is reading his at replies but they're there and he can't block them <laughs> yeah yeah not from his official i think potus account but i think from his donald j trump or whatever account he, he can, can do whatever he wants I, yeah. I believe that that's how that yeah. plays out i'm i'm not totally clear on that but i think it's interesting devinder you mentioned uh, aoc and her savvy use of social media and i think it's so fascinating that it ended up where she even led that twitter um, workshop for yep. <laughs> members yeah. of Congress, teaching the old right? <laughs> the olds how to use twitter yeah <laughs> exactly i taught regis philbin how to use twitter it did not end well <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> Within two weeks, it was like, I don't like this. People are talking back. Uh, are we leaving? People are talking back. That was one of the things uh, that was charming about Twitter. Exactly. In the early days, right? That was the point. I'm trying to say this is it. At first, he loved it. So he was like, oh, Leo, look, because he announced his retirement. That was the first thing he tweeted was, I'm retiring. And he got a lot of response and love and stuff. He called his wife. He said, Joy, Joy, you got to look at this. Look at They're all talking to me on, tw- on, the, on the Twitter. <laughs> He was so excited. But within two weeks, <laughs> the bloom was off the rose. He said, I don't like this Twitter thing. <laughs> this is, I'm done. It's over. We have people to do this for me. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> we Okay, there's just no question. We live in interesting times. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah. It's, it's, to me, it's fascinating. And, and I, uh, I just, I'm f- I just fascinated by it. Endlessly fascinated by it. I think it's still it's still cool if you have that moment where you can interact with it. We, you know, we talked about Twitter in the early days as as the great leveler, right? Like you could yeah. 
you could talk with somebody who is at a different level from you in terms of your profession or in terms of their celebrity or whatever. And I think you still have those moments from time to time. And it is a magical thing how, how that happens. It really is something that doesn't exist in pretty much any other format or platform. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's, a, it's a wonderful aspect of Twitter. I, I think it just, you know, it comes with some other stuff in the territory yeah. that is not as exciting. I think when I first jumped on Twitter, he used to describe it to people like uh, that scene in The Matrix where they're like, oh, the code is just flowing down and you know they can <laughs> see it. You know, you can see who's talking. They can see the conversation. That's it. That is the global pulse yeah. of conversation. It's just a shame. Like, oh, you take that to its logical conclusion. It's, yeah, a world leader using it to espouse whatever he wants and really right. toxic dialogue. And, yeah, it is sort of everything we wanted and everything, I guess, that comes with that, too. All the bad yeah. that comes with it. Yeah, totally. I, I, I'm I'm trying to trying to take the bright side to to take the optimistic approach to all of this stuff. <laughs> Twitter will save us all. Twitter will save us. Yeah, hmm. <laughs> or people will save us. Which I think it, it all comes down to people saving us. Yeah, uh, yeah. People but, being motivated enough to use the tools at their disposal will save us. What do you and do? What do you What do you say, Kate, to people? What is it that we need to do to to make this work? So right now, I think our biggest threat is climate change. And we need to be thinking about a bunch of different dimensions of threat at the same time. We need to be thinking about the threat of uh, of disintermediation of jobs from, from intelligent automation over the next few decades. And what does that look like? We don't, it's not the jobs that we have to worry about. It's the economic consequences of that and the socioeconomic fallout. And then what it means to our identities. But even while that's happening, we've got climate catastrophe happening in the background. So there's, and then there, there's this whole national, global uh, kind of identity politics happening. Or when I say identity politics, I mean on a on a national level, like nations trying to figure out where they fit on this global ecosystem scale. So I think there's just a lot that's happening all at once, and when we have the opportunity to use the exponential power of technology to help us solve an awful lot of those problems. We, we could be using AI and, and other forms of emerging technology to be addressing climate change issues in, in immediate ways if we were to put our resources that way, if we were to put our priorities in, in line that way. Hmm. I think it just comes down to that, to all of it, to, to kind of getting some consensus in place and getting some resources aligned that we're going to solve these problems. We're going to use what tools we have and solve the problems. That's, to me, the problem with cutting off one side of the conversation is it, nothing can be done unilaterally. It can't be done by one party. It can't be done by one nation. We're going to have to work together globally to solve these problems. And if we're all, if it's nothing but internecine war, uh, you know, Hatfields and McCoys, we're never we're going to be busy shooting each other, never going to break, buckle down to solving the the big problems. We yeah. have to first of all agree that there is a problem. That isn't even there. Yeah. I, that, that's yeah, the bigger think, thing. Yeah. And coming down to, you know, we'll, we'll come back to Devendra and ask him, you know, to uh, teach us all about philosophy so that we can better <laughs> understand <laughs> human I, I nature. Kant had I, nothing to say in yeah. this regard. <laughs> I'm just going to so, say. Leibniz, maybe. So much. I don't know. <laughs> all right. <laughs> I'm trying to find something positive. Let's see here. Something positive. Something positive. Uh, did we cover, I can't remember if we covered this last week. I thought this was one of the best stories of the week. Uh, let's see. This is the 23rd. No, I think this happened on Monday. The this, the website Genius. <laughs> using some real genius. So this is the lyrics site. It used to be Rap Genius. I love this site. It's a great site. Uh, they're not thrilled because Google now, if you search for lyrics... Uh, will deliver the entire lyric in its search results, meaning you no longer have to go to Rap Genius. Okay, that's fine if if maybe Google's getting it from the artist or they hired 30,000 people to write down lyrics or maybe they even licensed it from the publishing company. But Rap Genius thought, eh, I don't know where they're getting these lyrics, so what if we did something kind of funny? We used straight quotes and smart quotes in combination in a unique combination, in fact, I'll show you the video. This is an Alicia Cara um, uh, song. And in the lyrics of Alicia Cara's song, Not Today, they put a combination of straight quotes and smart quotes 
that if you just take the smart quotes. <laughs> okay, now that was Rap Genius. Now they're showing the Google results. Well, well, interesting. Exactly the same pattern. If you take the straight quotes and smart quotes and say the straight quotes are dots and the smart quotes are dashes, it spells out red handed in Morse code. <laughs> Busted. Busted, Google. It's very clever. And, you know, this is the exact reason why the EU um, has been very heavy handed on the likes of Google using snippets, using yeah. bits of code. It's for it's it's basically for this. And and similar has been uh, used as a reason why Google News is harming publishers, which I personally do not support at all. I don't think it does. That's what but, a little bit bothers me because this conflates the two. Because yeah. uh, two or three lines from an article with a link back to the article that snippets, mm -hmm. drives traffic uh, more than it would kill traffic. It's not stealing the content of the article. On the other hand, if in the search results, if you search for Alicia Cara lyrics, and uh, let's, what was the name of the song again? If I, I have to search for the song so that I can get the actual result. But if you search for Alicia Cara Not Today lyrics, you'll get the whole lyric. Let me do it here just to, just to prove this. Um, not today lyric. You won't get a link to Rap Genius. You'll, in the search results, not get a snippet, but you'll get the whole thing, thereby bypassing entirely traffic. Now, the second link, by the way, is to Genius. And Google has incidentally run a grep script now to remove all smart quotes from all search results. <laughs> <laughs> and I bet you Google's not the only one. This is a technique the map makers of old used to do. They'd put fake streets in and stuff because Rand McNally was sure that Thomas Guides was stealing their maps. So they put in little Easter eggs. And if the Easter egg showed up in the other guy's map, they'd say, gotcha, red-handed. You so know, somebody once did this uh, with a EULA um, many, many years ago as a way of showing oh, that nobody funny. actually uh -huh. reads a EULA. And it was some PC repair site in the US, I think, and it said, you know, halfway down the EULA, like if you if you were reading this and you've actually got this far down in the EULA, then, uh, you know, call this number or something and, and you'll get a thousand dollars or <laughs> it was something like that. And someone did it. Someone did it. Nice. But if you copied and pasted that EULA, you had, you were deeply regretful later on. Um, so Google, in their defense, says, well, uh, we didn't do it. We we hired somebody called Lyric Find. They did it. Which is very much like uh, Facebook saying, we're not responsible for those yeah. contractors. Uh, <laughs> they did it. Um, Lyric Find uh, is also disputing the allegations. They say, we have a whole content team devoted to compiling song lyrics from numerous sources, which can include them getting directly from the artist and songwriter as well as other websites. Well, maybe they aren't denying it. Yeah, they said they offered to remove lyrics that Genius said were stolen, but Genius didn't respond. Oh. And then they said, despite that, our team is currently investigating the content in our database and removing any lyrics that seem to have originated from Genius. <laughs> in other words, we're running a grep search for smart quotes right now. And exactly. all of them have Finding been... other sites, other different sites to steal lyrics from that yes, aren't Genius, right? That's so right. somebody who copied from Genius that they took, and it's like it's going all the way around. Honestly, Google could afford to license every one of these lyrics from the actual publisher is the people who publish the lyrics, right? Give some of the money back to the artist. What you yeah, but it's, co it's so complicated, yeah. right? Like this whole <laughs> structure is so complicated. Having to go, you, it's, you would have to have a third party that's managing all the, the rights and yeah. the access and, and so on. It is complicated, it, yeah. So maybe yeah. just publish the first verse <laughs> and link to Rap Genius. How about that? Or just paste and match style. <laughs> <laughs> There's the solution. You know that little paintbrush and word? Just use that from now on. Oh, that's hysterical. Paste and match style. <laughs> There's the fix. And all this time we thought we had to pay somebody. Uh, it's, it's a silly story because, I mean, it's just a he said, she said. By the way, Tom Petty, or the publisher of Tom Petty's music, uh, they also, Wixen, they also publish Rage Against the Machine and Weezer's music, is suing Pandora for using lyrics without any license. Pandora shows lyrics behind, uh, beneath the songs on some mobile and desktop apps. Uh, it's done that for 10 years, uh, using Lyric Find, by the way, for the rights. <laughs> it's all going to come down to Lyric Find anyway. Um, 
Wixen had, sp had sued Spotify over the same thing. This is, comes at a time that Apple has announced that they're going to start showing lyrics on Apple TV when you listen to music on Apple TV and Apple Music. But I bet you Apple is probably licensing it. That would be my guess. Well, Apple already had such long-standing relationships right. with publishers and with the industry, music I'm industry. Sure it's part of their mechanicals for the whole thing. They just say, oh, yeah, we, we would like to show lyrics. Is that okay with you? Actually, lyrics fall outside of mechanicals, as I understand. Oh, do it. they? Oh, interesting. Yeah. Oh. Twelve years in Nashville and a little oh, bit of songwriting. Oh, you know about this. You know what? <laughs> yeah. You know what mechanicals are. <laughs> what have you yeah. not done, Kate O'Neill? You've been around. Uh, it's really like I have the the craziest life. It's. <laughs> what did you do in Nashville? I moved there for songwriting, but I was also working in technology along alongside that. So for about the first five years, I was out every night playing at the writer's nights, playing my songs That's awesome. on a guitar. Yeah. I was drunk but, but the day my day. mama got out of prison. <laughs> Is that that kind of song? Yeah, that's where the song, you, you, you're you singing my song. <laughs> now you owe me. <laughs> if you show the lyrics, you have to pay me for those. <laughs> she got run over by that goddamn train. Uh <laughs> That's cool. Did you what kind? Did you write weepy uh, country songs or it was like pop country with a little calypso reggae thing nice. going on? <laughs> yeah. Did it, it not, was kind of a thing. A minute. That's awesome. Did it work out? Uh yeah, like no. <laughs> <laughs> but you lived the dream. You lived yeah, the dream. Yeah. It worked out in the sense that I got to be in Nashville during a really uh, big development time for their ecosystem, their tech ecosystem and their entrepreneurial scene. So I got was, to be part of helping. Was this after that. the Toshiba intranet or before the Toshiba? Yeah. Yes, it was after. What a yeah. checkered career. Wow. <laughs> I <know. laughs> and I should mention that Kate was also one of the first hundred employees at Netflix. That's right. So yeah, you could. We did a lot of copying and pasting of other people. <laughs> <movies>. That's right. <laughs> Although I love it that there's a there was a petition to Netflix saying you must cancel Good Omens, which is an Amazon so uh, show, by the way. So Netflix tweets in response to this petition, which had 20,000 signatures. OK, we promise not to do any more episodes of Good Omens. Thousands petition Netflix to cancel Amazon Prime's Good Omens, to which Amazon Prime responds. OK, Netflix we will cancel Stranger Things. If you cancel <laughs> good omens. I love it when brands tweet at each other. Uh, Every now and again it happens and it's a great, oh. it's a it's a lot of fun. Um, clearly the Christian group behind the petition uh, didn't watch the show and didn't really care. And the people <laughs> signing it didn't really care. They just see, this seems like a good idea. We'll sign They're that. They're just mad. They're yeah. just mad. We don't, it does glorify uh, the devil. And uh you know, it, it it portrays the Antichrist as a as just an average kid, so that's not good. Plus, God is voiced by Francis McDormand. Oh right? my God, so sacrilege! Yeah. <laughs> Everyone knows God's a man with a beard. <laughs> Francis McDormand, come on! I think that's the best. Got to be the best role ever. I actually like that show. I but I love the novel, a great uh, fantasy novel from Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett. And who doesn't love David David Tennant as a demon with demonic eyeballs? He was good in Jessica Jones. It's my, one of my favorite uh, favorite actors. You're in, British. Uh, in that you movie. should say he's Doctor Who. He is Doctor Who, but he's also Scrooge McDuck, and he's uh, <laughs> what's his name? Uh, I, I, Kill Kill Joy? No, hang on. What was his name in Jessica Jones? I don't Someone remember. Will but, I yeah, did yeah. find out, though, that uh, I thought the demon eyes were like special effects. They're just contact lenses, and you can buy them online <laughs> for 18 or $19, <laughs> any color, any kind. So if Much you, cheaper than special effects. Yeah, they're just they're contact lenses. These are, the, these are the ones that are really scary. They just make your whole eyeball black. You know, look at that. There's, you know there's something wrong. You just can't quite figure out, what, there's, some, what is, there's something wrong with that person. <laughs> Leo, how much how much would it take for you to wear a pair of these live on Twitter one week? <laughs> they may be on order. 
We'll see. Oh, they really? <laughs> <laughs> Can we start a GoFundMe for this? I mean, this sounds like a good I already idea. bought, I have, I'm a bad, uh, I bought on Kickstarter the uh, I, light up eyelashes. So <sighs> the F lashes. But uh, maybe I'll combine the two and then put in those fake teeth and you won't, you won't even know it's me. It'll be amazing. Our show today. <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about. Our the show Halloween today, episode is going to rock. Oh, Halloween. And then it would be, I'd have a good excuse. Our sh yes. Hmm. Kate, you want to come on the Halloween episode too? Yes. Hmm. Yes. You can come as a, beady eyes. A, a Nashville songwriter with BDS. <laughs> That'd be cool. Close. Too soon. That, too soon. <laughs> How many years did you do to, uh, to pursue that? I lived in Nashville for 12 years, but I was really only pursuing the songwriting for about five years. We got a drummer here. If I got, could you get your guitar? <laughs> Devendra, you want to play tambourine? I could do that. Yeah. Devendra's got baby gadgets that probably make noise. They probably so got many. little rattles. Yeah. Oh, but it's so good. <laughs> yeah. Our show today brought to you by Atlassian. Actually, our show today brought to you by our IT team. If you are in business these days, you know you owe it all to the IT team. Uh, Atlassian is a collaboration software company that powers IT teams all over the world. IT in the cloud environment, in the cloud world we live in, is, is at the center of everything. They have to plan and execute better and faster than ever. Today's apps are more complex than ever. Incidents require open, agile, and smart coordination between operations and your software developers. Expectations are high. The stakes are high. You got to perform. You cannot fall short inside of business critical workflow. That's why we use Atlassian tools. Jira, for instance. That's how we keep track of who's doing what, what projects they're working on, the status of the project. I think a lot of people know Jira, but think of it as a tool for agile development teams. Yeah, it's that, but it's so much more. We also use Confluence to document everything that happens. To me, that's almost the most important part. If, if you're doing something, you got to document it so that people who follow after know what you did know how to replicate the solution, that kind of thing. Atlassian is great because you don't have to ever leave the tools to get the job done. That's why I think our team likes it. It's not just for developers. Atlassian offers an affordable, reliable suite of tools for teams of all kinds and all sizes, from DevOps to Agile, from IT apps to Ops to ITSM to whatever's next for your team. If you've got uh, code, you need Bitbucket. Atlassian forms a backbone of effective cross-team project planning, organization, and communication. If you've got ops, this is something, uh, you know, back in the day we could have used this. Ops, genie, and status page. Not only so you can detect incidents, but so you can coordinate your response efforts. And most importantly, again, communicate with customers, stakeholders, the boss, about what's being done and how it's, how it's happening. And it all integrates seamlessly, so you never have to leave the platform. Our team loves Atlassian, you will too. The tools for your IT team are easy and free to try. Head to Atlassian.com slash teams slash IT and find out which Atlassian offering is right for your team. They've got a ton of them and more all the time. Try Atlassian today to see what IT can be. Atlassian.com slash teams slash IT. Ah, Devendra Hardwar is here and Gadget Senior Editor from uh, Bloomberg, their technology editor, the great Nate Cla Langson. Sta I always want to say I call you Claxon. Uh, maybe it's the drums, I don't know. Kate Langson, not, not Claxon, Langson. And Kate O'Neill, the tech humanist, speaker, writer, uh, koinsights.com. And you said that Kate O is your, is your Twitter handle, is the place to, right. to keep up with you. That's right. A little uh, too chatty on Twitter. Oh, really? Oh, I'm going to have to follow Kate O. <laughs> I think I already am. I think I must be. Boy, if I'm not. That's my, I don't, you know, I think you gotta my, get on that. my problem with Twitter is I don't, um, I don't respect it. <laughs> 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 I need to respect it more. I need to treat it more like a, like a partner. <laughs> You'd find out about stories like the light bulb if you did. I know there I'm missing go. out on all the all the fun. You just gotta dip in and dip out. That's a, with a drink in your hands. The best way to do it, <laughs> <laughs> or or having several drinks in your yeah. It's a cocktail party, basically. I see. I look at Twitter, and uh, even though you can now write 280 characters, everybody's really opting for brevity, and and I feel like I had a stroke. I I try to read it, and it doesn't make any sense. 
You know what I mean? If you read a page of text and nothing makes sense, you think I must be dying. My brain is, <laughs> I've, I've malfunctioned. No, it's just Twitter, Leo. Oh, good. Uh, an entirely new lexicon that people have It is, and I don't too. know. I Just the other day, we had uh, Sherilyn Lowe on from CNET, and she said, you subtweeted me. I didn't even know what that was. I had to look it up. Sherilyn's saying Gadget. I, I'm forced to work with her. So Oh, you, know, so you her. know Not CNET. And Gadget. <laughs> Thank you. I just subtweeted her, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I... No, so you can't subtweet him if you, you mentioned, mentioned her. him. Right. Yeah. So some person who doesn't work for CNET. Anyway, I am now following KO on the Twitter. Yay. Uh, Apple. We haven't talked about Apple yet. There's a couple of things on Apple. Not a whole lot. Apple's recalling a number of 15-inch MacBook Pros from the year 2015 over a fire risk. Uh, these are the MacBook Pros everybody still uses. The ones before the bad keyboard and the touch bar. Sure. Quote, unquote, fire risk. Yeah. Yeah, fire risk. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we don't want to... But we have a ton of these. We, uh, I, That's all I would use for a long time. Um, apparently, the batteries. Actually, this is kudos to Apple. You get a brand new battery for your five-year-old laptop, four-year-old laptop. It, the, this uh, laptop sold between 2015 and Feb of uh, September 2015 and February 2017. There is a little tool on the Apple recall site. You can enter your serial number and uh, find out. I was kind of hoping initially they'd just give me a new one, but apparently there are no new ones. <laughs> so you just get a new battery. That's not much of a story. Uh, let's see. Apple says if we had to, if we had to, uh, we could make our phones uh, outside of China. If we had to, they're right now exploring a shift of anywhere from 15 to 30 percent of its capacity to somewhere else in Southeast Asia. This is according to a report from Nikkei Asia Review. A fundamental restructuring of Apple's supply chain. This has to do, of course, with tariffs. But also, I think, some concern over products made in China, right? Mm -hmm. After the Huawei... What is this... Uh, Vinder, what's the status with the, uh, the Huawei ban? Are we still... I haven't fully I haven't fully checked in on it, but it does seem like that's it's an ongoing thing. Huawei is pretending they haven't done anything wrong, and they're kind of standing firm there, and things are getting worse. Basically. And, and Washington yeah. is pretending they have. Yeah, we don't have I, evidence I, on either side, to be honest. The with truth you. probably lies somewhere in the middle. I think there yeah. is there is some valid suspicion around any of the companies that are directly tied to the Chinese government. Right. Uh, I'm surprised Apple's making this move now. I guess just when it when tariffs are a potential thing or around the trade war, and not like the yeah the behavior of the Chinese government and what they're doing. Uh, to, yeah, with uh with with some of their population as well. Like there's there's a lot of things to be. Uh, concerned about with what China is doing right now, too. Yeah, this is another mm -hmm. one of those where there uh, doesn't seem to be a clear uh, answer one way or the other. I did look when this story surfaced, I was looking up uh, what the latest information is about what it would cost Apple if they were to make the phone, the iPhones, for example, in the U.S., which isn't on the table, but just out of sheer speculation, and I, the latest that I saw was uh, the, if they got the raw materials for about 600 and could manufacture, the cost of the manufacture wouldn't significantly go up, but the the overall price there they speculate would come to around two thousand dollars at retail. Whoa! Yeah. Okay, that's not that's a non-starter. But the key issue they're saying is is not so much the the cost of the materials; it's that. If you've ever seen the uh, the way that uh, Chinese factories have really, or, or the the process has come to sophistication in, in China, we're not set up for that. We would be looking at um, an entirely new set of skills, an entirely new set of competencies for manufacturing facilities here that we we don't have, and it's going to happen. You know, Foxconn is setting up a facility. In what is it, Wisconsin? Well, so maybe I, <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> the, Possibly. Yeah, so, they're they're going to take you know. the money and then think about it. Okay, <laughs> but it's going to take some time to yeah. figure out, you know, what it even looks like to have a facility like that in the U.S. It's, it's crazy. So, yeah, it's crazy. I think everybody's just hoping the trade war will blow over and we can go back to business as usual. It is a. This is we are so. 
interdependent on one another, not just the U.S. and China, but everybody in the world, mm. to say, oh, this part of the world, you can't make stuff for us, is just impossible. I think it's just impossible. But a, a similar thing happened with ZTE, right, in 2018. Put them out of business, right? Almost. Almost. But then, Almost it was pulled, yeah. but then it was pulled back. Then it was pulled back. And I, you know, I, I believe a similar thing could happen here. It's just, I mean, it's having a pretty devastating effect on Huawei. You they know, seem covered, to be pretending to that it's not, but I get the feeling it is, right? They've, they've stopped. Well, you just have to look at the, the, the plummeting sales of their smartphones right. worldwide. I mean, they are just tanking. Mm -hmm. um, nobody, nobody wants to buy them. Mm. Um, and it's, um, yeah, I mean, we, we've still got this issue in the UK over whether to rip out all the 5G hardware that's been installed. You know, we recently had 5G rollout um, nationwide by one of our uh, networks. And, you know, a lot of the technology that they're using is, is Huawei. But they don't know whether they're going to have to just rip all that out and replace it with something else. Um, and we, we've got no clarity even on when a decision about it is going to be made, thanks to our super organized government right now um what, so, is, what is going on over there uh, by the way dude i mean at this point uh, <laughs> who knows who knows we, i don't know i all i i love this the, is he the speaker of parliament that's the only that's the hero to us here yeah i love him yeah he uh john john uh Burkow. Yeah, he's an interesting he's an interesting guy. If you watch a lot of the, I mean, don't ever watch Parliament live like I have to sometimes. Oh, it's enjoyable uh, for us. It's, well, it's it is hysterical. sometimes. It is sometimes. But I was I was doing a thing um, on on my uh, podcast this week about the pornography uh, age gate law that's got pushed back because government forgot to tell the EU about part of it, so they had to delay it by six months because they just, literally they just Whoops. administrative error. Well, um, but also that may not have been the best plan because the um, at least one of the age verification companies was the biggest pornographer in the world. The people behind YouTube, uh, YouPorn, a parent company of yeah. Um, but, so but really, I mean, the, the age reason. verification stuff comes from the people who produce the pornography. Yes, who you would have to send a scan of your passport to, which oh. sounds perfectly safe. I can't <laughs> wait to do that. And then, or um, you'd go to a pub, right? You could go to a pub and buy a license. What was it? there? Was, it was crazy. Yeah, I think I think if it got enforced, people would be going to pubs and buying more than uh, just a license <laughs> in order to not get around the <laughs> law. I can't speak from personal experience. Here is but. The, the best part of uh, of this is John Burkow, who is the... Do you have my sound? <laughs> As Speaker of the House, it does not tolerate any mischief from MPs. Mr. Lewis, get a grip of yourself, man. We need this in the Congress. Um, take up <laughs> yoga, you'll find it beneficial, man. I say to member... Order! Resume your seat, Mr. Harper. You don't stand when I'm standing, and that's the end of it. Mr. Angus Brendan McNeil, calm yourself. You may be a cheeky chappy, but you're also an exceptionally noisy one. <laughs> the Prime Minister will please withdraw the word idiot. It's unparliamentary, a simple... Why don't we have somebody we'll like this in we'll Congress? Go. That's what I want to know. Put it back. No, no, no. <laughs> oh, this is famous. This guy stole the mace the Honourable Gentleman to withdraw immediately from the House for the remainder of this day's sitting. This is intolerable behaviour as far as the public... No, it's not funny. Nor does he <laughs> like his authority. <laughs> He's like the principal of Parliament. I am, I, you think you're amusing? You are not amusing. Oh, my God. John Burkow. <laughs> is he a big hero in Britain? Because he ought to be. It depends who you ask. He'd have a talk show here in the United States. He'd be on against, you know, uh, Ellen. In fact, he's going to take Ellen's job, I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure Ellen would enjoy being interviewed by him <laughs> in such a circumstance. I think they're, they're quite different people, but they, I'd, I'd tune in. Um, I'd like to see Ellen in his role, honestly. Yeah, maybe That's, Ellen could do a good job. Yeah. She'd have a button she could push that the member of parliament would just disappear. Uh, poor, I, I feel so bad for uh, Matthew Miller uh, of ZD and that fame. Uh, great guy. We had him on uh, Tech News Weekly on Thursday talking about this. He uh, woke up a week ago, 1130 at night. His oldest daughter shook his shoulder to wake him up from a deep sleep. She says, Daddy, Daddy, your Twitter account has been hacked. 
He writes, it turns out it was much worse than that. He had an alert on his phone saying, the SIM card for your number has been changed. If this change is not authorized, call 611. Well, he writes, seeing as how T-Mobile took away my cell service, I couldn't call 611, so that was worthless. <laughs> he, he had a Google Fi SIM, and he called T-Mobile, and they said, yeah, uh, yeah, somebody called. You called. You called and uh, said, uh, change my SIM. <laughs> the you that called was not him. It was, of course, a hacker. The representative said, well, we can't really tell who's a, who over the phone. So as long as some key information uh, is provided, we can authorize a swap. So they authorized the swap. Now, without his password, without Matthew's Google password, the bad guys were able to take over Google, his Gmail, Twitter. And then once having taken over Gmail, they were able to reset his accounts. They got into his bank account, bought $25,000 worth of Bitcoin. It was a nightmare. I think he's pretty much dug out now. But imagine. And and the the most notable point on this is do not, do not, do not rely on uh, SMS for authentication. And if you're forced to, as many of us are, my bank will only take SMS. Make sure that you uh, call your carrier and uh, some will allow a PIN number, T-Mobile will. And set that up so that somebody without the PIN number cannot do this. Really? Such an amazing story. Is this? Did it originate with his T-Mobile account being yeah. hacked? Is yeah. that okay. Not hacked. They called uh, customer service and said, hello, I'm Matthew Miller. I want to uh, swap SIM cards. Still okay, Matthew, right. what's your mother's yeah. maiden name? Or whatever. I don't know what the security question was, but clearly it wasn't very secure. Wow. Uh, good advice to everybody, actually, in his uh, ZDNet column um, on how to, you know, lock down your accounts. Certainly put a PIN number. I use uh, Google Fi, and Google Fi automatically does uh, uh, actually a very – you'd expect Google to get this right, and they did. The very secure PIN number that's changed every time you log into your Google account. Um, ter yeah, terrifying. By the way, uh, at the end, he says – I'm. If anyone has tips on how I can get my Google and Twitter accounts back, I'd appreciate it. So <sighs> I guess he's still he's still yeah, out of luck. Another reminder, don't use text-based uh, two-factor. Terrible. But yeah. but most banks do. My bank does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, more and more are supporting other things too, like authenticators. Good. Um, I haven't seen too many banks do authenticators, so you're right there. Yeah. I have a YubiKey on my uh, keychain. Carry with me at all times. Um, and I, you know, everything that I can, I have, uh, on that YubiKey and, and, and if you can, and Google will allow you to turn this off, Twitter will not turn off SMS. Twitter still has SMS authentication and, as a fallback and, and always has it. There's nothing you can do about it. You can say, I want to use a YubiKey, but they'll still use SMS. If you say, oh, I can't find my YubiKey. I hope, wow. I hope this is an example that, uh, maybe some of these companies pay attention to. Oh, I was doing Apple stuff. I'm sorry. Let's see. <laughs> no, it's not that much to say. Best Buy is now going to be uh, an authorized Apple repair. 1,000 plus Best Buy stores across the nation. Apple certified repairs. This is something Apple started doing. It's funny. For a long time, uh, there were, uh, you know, Apple VARs and resellers and Apple authorized repair centers. And then eventually, once Apple opened the retail stores they kind of closed all these down they disappeared and it was a real loss i thought because apple you know well for a lot of reasons it's nice to have a shade tree mechanic go ahead i, I like this story though because i like i like the idea of an ecosystem play and and that i i liked when uh, i was at apple um i was at adobe summit in march and heard uh Hubert Jolly, who was then the CEO at Best Buy, talking about this total tech support package they had rolled out for oh. it's a two hundred dollar program a year that they will support all the tech, all the gadgets in your home, even if they didn't sell it to you. 
so that's a pretty interesting play, I thought, mm. you know, to, to offer into a subscription household tech support service. And so it's neat to think of them figuring out a way to partner with Apple on this and, and kind of entrench that further, offer value back to Apple buyers, offer value back to Best Buy. It seems like a pretty smart way to add value across that whole ecosystem. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the only problem is that people historically have not really trusted uh, Best Buy's technicians. Uh, it That's the geek know, squad, the, right? That's the geek yeah. squad. So there's good and bad. And I've heard a lot of bad stories and a lot of yeah, me uh, too. new things about them upselling mm -hmm. unnecessary but gear. But there are very good geek squad yeah. people too. It really are, That's the problem. Are. It's hit or miss. You're gonna, you might get somebody great. Yeah. You might not. I agree I'm with surprised. you though. We desperately mm -hmm. need something like this, Kate, because- yes. Yeah, you know, I was uh, a half an hour late to the show because I had I spent an extra half hour after the radio show helping an eighty year old woman who had a Macintosh that was loaded with malware, adware, all sorts of stuff, and she, there was nowhere she could go. Where are you going to go yeah. for something like that? So, yeah, and that it seems really encouraging. I mean, the, the the example that Hubert Jolly gave at at Adobe Summit was. You know, you, you deal with something like trying to watch a show on Netflix and maybe you're dealing with the, the Netflix service itself, itself on right. top of a Roku, on top of your internet service provider, on top of whatever. I mean, there's so many layers of complexity that the average household is set up with. And that's not even taking into account all of the Internet of Things kind of smart home automation right. stuff. So there's just a ton of complexity that people are adding into their households and without anyone who necessarily has the expertise to troubleshoot all this stuff. Of course, yeah, I mean, that's a holistic, it would be nice to take a holistic approach. Of course, Apple's response to this is, well, it would all be fine if you just only buy Apple stuff, <laughs> right? And you need it an Apple works. TV. What's this Roku? You need an Apple TV. You need an app. Oh, but you don't make a router. Hmm. You need, a, but if, if you just bought all Apple stuff, then you'd know who to call, but that's not yeah. practical. The, the Best Buy thing, it's I'm surprised, too, that it's taken so long for even them to do, do this because they've had Geek Squad for so long. Right. Uh, an all-inclusive, you know, annual package just kind of makes sense. Uh, there was, I think there was a tech support startup that somebody, I forget who Oh, it there was. are quite a few. But there were, somebody who would just, like, send a person yeah, to your house. There was, we in fact, we had him as an advertiser early on. Okay. I want to say uh, Geeks on Call or something like that. I can't remember mm. the name. But yeah, there've been a, a few attempts at this. I, it doesn't. It seems to be a low a low margin business, and the real problem yeah. is yeah. training. And this is where I would hope Apple would come come to the Best Buy Geek Squad folks or bring them to to Cupertino or something, and really give them some training. Apple used to do really good training with its geniuses. I think they've they've slowed down on that. My experience with uh, for, for, has been that the Apple geniuses are not as genius as they used to be. <laughs> <laughs> They're Apple sub geniuses, but uh, I think that's an opportunity. It, it, the problem is that somebody who's that smart and that good can make a lot more money than he yep. can at the Geek Squad. Yeah, well, then they can at the Genius Bar too, probably. Yeah, you know, yeah. It, it, it it just says in this story uh, that I read about this that there's now because of this there's Apple certified. Repairs courtesy of 7,600 newly Apple certified technicians. So that's a wonderful volume to add into the, the landscape. Um, you know, so it, it, it has been frustrating to be in this gap between where Genius Bars existed <laughs> and where you can now get some kind of support at maybe Best Buy. But um, yeah, there, there does seem to need to be some kind of, of service offering out there and i think i think this idea from best buy is a is a solid mm -hmm. one I'll, i look forward to seeing how it plays out for them and also something you could probably like gift for your family members just like uh if you're the family tech support person maybe get your parents this or something this, it's it a was, little passive aggressive yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah don't yeah, call yeah. me call the geek squad <laughs> it was uh nerds on site they used to advertise with us in fact their uh, their founder is still in the chat room from time to time david redekop i see him from time to time. Um, I'm curious if uh, David, if you're listening, I'd love to know uh, how you get how you get good quality people. I mean, they have a very they've been doing it since '95. They have a, a, and a very good reputation, but it must be difficult to get and retain good technicians. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's an expensive thing. That's why I remember Dell used to have this great tech support, really great. I remember going down to Austin to visit the call center, and these guys were super smart. 
but it was just not cost effective. And I don't, I don't know what the answer is uh, to that, but clearly we need it. <laughs> Normal people cannot be expected to use technology safely and uh, effectively. Yeah. They just can't. And that one you have to re. I was going to say, now when you have to restart your light bulb 12 times. <laughs> exactly. <Jeez. laughs> uh, we had a fun week this week on Twitter. We have, do we have a little, uh, Kevin, a little uh, video, a little something prepared for the people that they can watch? This is what you might have missed this week on Twit. Previously on Twit. Mary Jo, I know you know Hen House Brewing Company. I've heard of them. They're, I don't know if I've had a Across the street. But I thought you'd enjoy this one. Keanu is immortal. <laughs> Oh, that's perfect. <laughs> Windows Weekly. If you want to run the world, but you yeah. realize you can't get elected, well, what? how much better than a global yeah. currency? Set so your site a little higher. Uh, your site's a little higher. Maybe like Bond villain level. Yeah. Like, um, <laughs> yeah. Em world. This is emperor of the world. This is not president. Yeah. All about Android. Could we nominate the NVIDIA Shield for in entry into the Android Hall of Fame as one of the most durable and used and loved products? This sucker yeah. is still updated and it came out in Carrying the flag yeah. for Android yeah. TV. This Week in Enterprise Tech. There's no question that this has been an expensive year for municipalities having to deal with ransomware. Are there any sort of hard and fast rules that say, okay, it's okay to pay whatever the attackers want just to get the data back? Hands-on tech. I have right here the 10.1 inch on tablet and I've been living with it for a little over a week. And let me just say, I have thoughts. Twit, put down <laughs> the kick and tap the twit. <laughs> uh, you see, if you just, you know, watch, just all we ask, five, ten hours a day, just watch, <laughs> and you'll be really up to date on what's uh, what's going on. Twit.tv. Our show today brought to you by HelloFresh. I am looking forward to going home and making a fabulous dinner. This is a good example you know, of why you want HelloFresh. I'm working all day. I get home. I'll get home at dinner time. I don't have time to plan a meal, to to shop for ingredients, and to make it. But I want I don't want to go out to McDonald's either. I want something fresh and healthy and delicious. Hello Fresh. I get to home and I there it is in the fridge. I go Hello Fresh. Hello Fresh offers home cooked meals made simple because they provide you with all the ingredients to really neat recipes. And they'll put you a little bit. I like it because I like to cook, but I, you know, I'm getting a rut. Don't we all cooking the same thing day in day out? Taco Tuesday, you know, lasagna Wednesday. Get outside your comfort zone. Discover new delicious recipes. You'll be able to put together in 30 minutes or less. Let them do the meal planning, the shopping, the prep. You conquer the kitchen, and it smells great in the house. And people come with excitement to sit down at the table. Each box comes with fresh, pre-measured ingredients and easy-to-follow recipe cards. No more than six steps, even pictures, so you know what you know what this is supposed to look like. And it comes right to your door in a special insulated box. They even have instructions on how to recycle everything in the box. You don't even have to leave your house. They have three meal plans to choose from: classic, veggie, and family. But you're not locked in once you choose your plan. You could change it at any point to match your taste buds or your mood. Make family dinners fuss-free with HelloFresh's picky eater kid-tested and approved family plan recipes. It's a great thing to do with the kids, too, by the way. They're going to have to learn how to cook. Make it fun. Make it exciting. They have fun menu features, too. Things like dinner to lunch. So you get uh, dinner, but you also get a nice little lunch. Uh, all from the dinner and from leftovers. 20-minute meals, gourmet, and my favorite, because I don't like to wash dishes, one pot wonders and more. Make deliciousness part of your week every week. And we've got a really good deal for you. $80 off your first month. Go to HelloFresh.com slash Twit80. Twit80. Use the code Twit80. And you'll get $20 each off your first four boxes. That's $80 in the first month. Take back your kitchen with HelloFresh. HelloFresh.com slash Twit80. Don't forget that offer code Twit80. We thank you, HelloFresh, for supporting This Week in Tech. And uh, we thank you for supporting This Week in Tech by using that uh, special offer code. HelloFresh.com slash Twit80. Twit80 is the offer code. I'm starting to... I, I'm going to let leave you guys to tell me if I'm starting to think like the Washington Post has it out for technology companies. They did a, a piece. I thought it was a good piece, uh, maybe a little uh, slanted about uh, the iPhone and how f he left it overnight. Was it Jeffrey Fowler? Left it overnight. 
and it contacted 5,000 different sites. They didn't mention he put a lot of different apps on it and so forth. Now he's doing a privacy experiment with Google's Chrome. 11,000. Now he calls them tracker cookies in a single week. And Firefox was glad to talk about this because he says Firefox <laughs> does not and is better. But is so what do you think, Nate? Is this a little uh, is a little slanted against Chrome? I mean, uh, cookies are not the end of the world despite what you might think if you go wandering around the web these days. Well, I I I, I don't know what his methodology was, but it wouldn't surprise me to be perfectly honest. Like a lot of the problem is these things, you know, it's these background background processes that we generally always turn them on and leave them on. But what we don't do is monitor what they're doing in the background overnight. And I think that was part of his point. Right. I mean, on, on Apple, I would I would be I was a little more surprised at the, the, the numbers because Apple tends to be a little more conservative over what apps are allowed to do what in the background with Google, though. I always think, why is anybody surprised? You know, it's a most of Google's products don't cost you anything. I mean, I'm excluding obviously like phones and the Google Home, but I mean, in terms of its web, its web products, you're not paying for them really. So um, 11,000, I don't know. It doesn't sound like a massive number to me. I mean, rather, it doesn't sound it like sounds a believable. surprising number. Yeah, to it's me. credible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So he calls them tracker cookies. He said they would be autom they're automatically blocked by Firefox. But cookies by themselves are not a bad thing. It's how a website knows you're you when you go back to the website. There's a lot of cookies that you want, I think. Try and if you don't believe me, go into Google, go into Chrome and turn off cookies. You can. You can do that in any browser. Say, I don't want you to save any cookies. And then see what your web experience is like. It's not fun. Yeah. But you don't no. have – that's sign-in data for like the sites, the handful of sites you actually use. But that's – it's not going to be 11,000, right? And I think what, what Jeff is doing is kind of interesting because it kind of goes to like, um, we're talking, we complain now about Chrome being a memory hog, about being all these sorts of things. When it first came out, it was the fast competitor to yeah. even Firefox and to yeah. Internet Explorer. Not now anymore. it's become the dominant browser. Yeah. What What is weighing Chrome down? Uh, cookies don't take up much disk, disk space. They don't really hinder your system that much. But this is another... This is another sign of bloat that kind of worries me um, and another reason why we should probably take a closer look at Firefox. Um, but even like Microsoft with their next edge, they're also going to be uh, blocking certain types of cookies. They have a really understandable security system that they're going to be producing with that browser. And I think that's going to be an important thing moving forward because people are caring more about privacy now. So. This seems useful. This is not just like anti Google. I think this is it's kind of a wake up call to like, you know, all of us who have been using Chrome for so long um, to remind us of the cost of using Chrome, basically. And maybe maybe there's a reason to use another browser or at least consider one. He said, uh, I watched Aetna and weirdly, the federal student aid website set cookies for Facebook and Google. In other words, they told Facebook and Google that that. You, he was on the insurance site or the loan services login page. So I don't know if that's an oversight from Aetna and the FSA site or if it's a convenience because they use Google sign-on and Facebook sign-on. It's not completely clear. It he sounds like pixel whole, tracking. It, maybe this. it is pixel yeah. tracking. And he points out that Google did change their policy uh, that you're, as soon as you use G Gmail at any time, you're automatically now logged into Google constantly whenever you use chrome you're 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 in google so google does know where you're going at this point um i i yeah i want to know more about the methodology cookies are part of the internet the modern internet and not a bad thing tracking cookies maybe i i've been using brave of late i don't know do you guys familiar with brave do you do you know it do you like it the browser never really looked at it yeah yeah brave is a privacy based version of chromium so it's chrome but for instance they have settings in the brave browser to turn off all that single sign-on stuff from linkedin facebook google and twitter uh, and that means no tracking information will be sent back to those sites because you don't even have to be using it to because that that's going to ping those sites every time you go there um you know brave brave seems to do a pretty good job there are other privacy focused browsers like vivaldi opera both of which are based on chromium and Microsoft's doing its version of Edge based on Chromium. And I think Microsoft's also saying, yeah, we're not going to do all that stuff that 
that Google's doing right now. I I am not a fan of Firefox. I just can't. It's just an aesthetic thing to me. <laughs> but maybe maybe what do you use, Kate? <laughs> I switched to Firefox. Uh, I, you know, I've been back and forth over the years to different browsers. And I, in this last year, I saw um, a woman who was one of the leaders at Firefox speaking about security and data privacy. And she sold me. So uh, I switched. And okay. it's, it is an aesthetic difference. You're right. It, it does kind of change the way things are rounded and the default fonts. And, you know, everything is just a little different. Um, but I think, you know, it is important to your point that, we understand that cookies themselves are not the bad, you know, they're not the evil that we're, that it sounds like we're talking about here. Cookies are an important part of personalizing content and making it convenient and easy for all of us to, to do what we do in the contemporary usage of the web. But I remember, you know, about a dozen years ago, whenever you would sign up to, when, whenever you were doing something that required a new tool or a new, um, like you were adding some functionality to a website, it was always like, oh, it's just one line of JavaScript that you add to the checkout page or something like that. Like one line of JavaScript. It's like one cookie. And after you do this for a number of years, <laughs> you've got Thousands. another line of JavaScript and another cookie. Yeah. And it's just we've accumulated a lot of this craft. So I think it's a good it's a good awareness campaign to to bring our attention to it. We're all being tracked all the time. There's right. so much of a data trail that we're all generating in everything that we do. It's good to be aware of that. And at the same time, you know, I, I don't think it's good to panic about that. I also think you, all you got to do is is go to Europe and use a browser. Yeah. <laughs> Nate knows. Like the moment yeah. you try to hit any website, you're being prompted, do you accept these cookies? It's the, the whole GDPR implementation is a real user experience like nuisance. And that's a and so failure. It's not, it's not that's, ideal. That's clearly a failure because it becomes then it becomes background noise. Every site uses mm -hmm. cookies. Every site warns you they use cookies. The first thing you do when you go to a new site is you click that banner which is an annoying yeah, right. extra click, and it solves nothing. No, it solves right. nothing. It's. I mean, we've got to the point now, honestly, where ads are the least annoying things on the web <laughs> in Europe. <laughs> I would. I would take. I would take pop-ups oh, any bad. day over what we have to put up with in Europe. That's um, bad. I don't trust any web browser either. I mean, I use. I use Safari. Um, because I trust Apple slightly more than I trust any of the others. I don't use any Google products whatsoever um really yeah the only one, the only one I use is google search i use google search oh. in a in a private window but that's okay. the only one i don't use anything else all right um because i i don't trust them i think i think more people should be massively distrustful of a lot of these companies to yeah. be honest so anything that raises awareness is good one thing right. i will agree i think that the problem with uh, jeffrey's article is written for a general audience and so it doesn't tell me the specifics that i'd like to know it sounds like, I don't know if all 11,000 of those tracking cookies, so-called tracking cookies, were third-party cookies. The third-party cookies are a problem. And that's the case when Aetna is setting a cookie for Facebook, a third party. And every browser except Chrome lets you turn that off. No brow In fact, most browsers' default is block third-party cookies. Don't allow a site that you're visiting to set a cookie for another site like Facebook when you're visiting it. And that's really most of the tracking. So... I don't know if Jeffrey's saying, yeah, I had 11,000 third-party cookies set. If that's the case, that's appalling. Um, and I guess I should do my own research. But in, but in every browser, including Safari, Firefox, Edge, uh, everything but Chrome, as far as I could tell, you can block third-party cookies. And in most cases, that's default and should be default. Because that's the one, well, that's the tracking cookie. There's even a tweet, and I, I uh, tweeted it, I retweeted it um, uh, most recently on my account, but there's a tweet from the Pinboard account, um, yeah. which oh, points Maché's, out that the... Oh, this, this he, is such a good article. Go ahead. Yeah, so he points out that um, the Washington... Well, it's not the article that, that we, uh, you're, I think you're about to reference, but okay. he points out that this Washington Post article about the, the web Google's web browser contains itself... Oh, yeah. A bunch of of uh, ad cruft and, and, and including from the Washington Post, and it doesn't contain disclosure. Which he goes on through a nice tweet thread to to sort of pack, unpack that and and what that really means. But I think that the overall kind of gist of of this from from the big picture perspective is you can't cause panic about this. It's not it's not a a crisis when cookies are set. But if we're going to talk about 
cruft and, you know, a bunch of junk being set in browsers, then we have to be really candid about where these are being set, what they're being set for. And I think you're right, Leo, that, you know, we got to understand the difference between first and third party cookies. We got to understand why we got to understand what they're accomplishing for us. And, and none of, none of this is happening in this article or in the GDPR or in anything that's happening right yeah. now. So and when I still see, a long way to go. When I see at the beginning of the article a video of some guy walking down the street being followed <laughs> by cookies, yeah. I guess, I feel like that's a little sensationalistic. Yes, the Washington Post is setting cookies too. And in fact, right. in his previous article about his iPhone phoning home, he does mention it in the article. Uh, among those apps was Washington Post's own app that did, in fact, do exactly the same thing. So, yeah, hmm. I don't know. I don't, uh, yeah, f use Firefox if you feel better about Firefox. Uh, I like Brave. I use Brave for the most part. Uh, on the Mac, I use Safari because I feel like, do you think, do you guys think that Apple is now becoming the de facto protector of privacy for some people? Like, do people trust, what do you think, uh, uh, do you, Nate, do you think that Apple is the trustworthy company in this? I, I look at it the other way around. I look at who is the least untrustworthy. <laughs> oh, <laughs> good. And I have That's very British because, of you. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so let me let me walk back slightly on this because uh, uh, maybe 2 years ago I did an audit of all my data. Oh, partly smart. out of privacy concerned, part uh, concerns partly out of pure economics. And I had I had subscriptions I was paying for for Google Drive, for Dropbox, for iCloud, for Evernote, for Re, uh, pockets for like loads and loads of things. And I thought, well, a lot of this, probably like 90% of this, I'm getting from uh, from Apple's own apps and iCloud, and I can unify there. Um, and that includes email, that includes, you know, maps and a, a bunch of other stuff, storage. Um, and I sort of thought, well, if I'm going to give, I don't want any large company having all of my data but if I'm going to let any one company have all my data, I'd rather it be a company that doesn't technically need it. Um, Apple's, <laughs> Apple wants me locked into its ecosystem for another whole load of reasons, which is to make sure I keep buying iMacs and iPhones and iPads and stuff. Um, but it doesn't need it to sell that data uh, or rather to, to use that data to, to sell me other things or to market to me or things like that. So look so at I the thought, business well, model then. I always look at the business model. It's yeah. why I was, you know, I, in the very beginning of, of the show today, I was talking about Facebook. Like the, the fundamental of that, of using cryptocurrency isn't what bothers me. It's it's taking a step back and, and asking, well, why, why did this idea come up in the first place? What isn't it doing that it wants to do that this helps it do? And I think the same is true when it comes to who has your data and who you trust. Yeah. And I think that I'd rather it be a company that just wants to sell me products and rather than you know, use my data for something else. I think that's a good litmus test. What what do they what do they make their money on? And if they make their money on uh, advertising, uh, and in particular if their advertising is based on what they know about you, then just consider that they're going to collect that information. That's their business model. Apple has another yeah. business model, which may also involve exploiting you and extracting money from you. <laughs> <laughs> but who doesn't? I mean, that's my job too. Right? How can I get more money out of you, the listener? <laughs> I think about that at night, all night long. How can I extract more money? But first, a word with Wasabi Hot Cloud Storage. What a great name. Wasabi is that hot stuff you have with your sushi. This is the Hot Cloud Storage, which is about the hottest topic in the world today, is moving to the cloud. By 2025, in six years, 80% of enterprises will have literally shut down their traditional data centers. It's 10% right now. Moving to the cloud for cost savings, operational efficiencies, a transformative way of scaling your business. By then, it's estimated there will be 163 zettabytes in the cloud. That's 21 zeros. 163 zettabytes in the cloud. But it's important when you put stuff in the cloud, I know this is a concern for anybody looking at cloud, that your data be safe that it be secure, and I've got something that is actually arguably more secure than your own on-premises. I know it is. Wasabi was started by these two guys, Jeff Flowers and David Friend, good friends of mine. I've known David for years. They figured out and patented a revolutionary way of writing data on disks sequentially, not in blocks, which made it more efficient and faster. That's what Wasabi's based on, this, this enterprise-grade cloud storage that 
with this patented technology is 80% cheaper than Amazon S3, 80% less expensive and up to six times faster and as secure as you can get, 11 nines of durability. It's really remarkable. They, I'll tell you, there's some of the things that they do that mean you will not be like that Florida city that just paid $600,000 in ransomware fees because they, you can designate some data as immutable. Can't be changed by ransomware or fungible-fingered employees or anything. Immutable. That's brilliant. There's no charge for egress, no charge for API access. It uses the S3 API, so you already know how to use it. HIPAA, FINRA, CJIS compliant. Look, I know... The boss has sent you off to research cloud storage solutions, and you're going to, of course, you're going to come back with the big three names. You're going to have Amazon and Microsoft and Google on there. I just want you to add a fourth name, Wasabi. Try it yourself, W-A-S-A-B-I.com. Click the free trial link, offer code TWIT, unlimited storage for a month. So you can slam stuff up there. They also have, if you, if you want to migrate a ton of data, you can migrate up to a petabyte at a time with the Wasabi ball, which is so cool. This is the solution you've been looking for. 80% more affordable, six times faster, 11 nines of durability, no charge for API access, no charge for egress. You just got to try it. Wasabi, W-A-S-A-B-I dot com. Oh, don't forget the offer code TWIT for unlimited storage. Wasabi, W-A-S-A-B-I dot com. <laughs> Mache uh, Chick, I hope I know I'm pronouncing his name completely wrong. Even though he has uh, uh, an entire website devoted to how to pronounce his name, Mache Chiklevsky, he created Pinboard, which I use religiously, and he's become actually a great blogger. His Idle Words uh, blog talks uh, this week about what he calls the new wilderness. He's talking about a kind of privacy we don't really think about. He calls it ambient privacy that there is a value in having our everyday interactions with one another remain outside the reach of monitoring, and that the small details of our daily lives should pass by unremembered. Not every conversation needs to be a deposition. And, and he, he's pointing out that in this modern world, it's, it's not the case, that every single thing you do is being tracked and recorded. Did you, I think, Kate, you must have done your homework for this show and read that article, it sounds like. Yeah, I'm yeah. I'm impressed. You know, uh, these guys have been around a while. They don't read anything we talk about. <laughs> <laughs> I liked the line. He said, to what extent is living in a surveillance-saturated world compatible with pluralism and democracy? See, that's the real question, right? Yeah. Does, does this, it's, it's one thing to give this up. Eh, it's a little thing. Who cares? But is, if the consequence of giving it up is that we can't function as a democracy, that's a serious consequence. You'll have to read the, uh, the piece. It's a very good piece to understand why he links the two. Um, but I think that it is a pre... He says, and I agree with this, a shared sense of reality, an agreement on common facts is a prerequisite for self-government. And that is something, for whatever reason... This goes back to Ravelry and Twitter. For whatever reason, that seems to be the case, that we no longer have a shared sense of reality, that we're living in our own fractured worlds. Um, good, Really good piece from Maché. It was a really good piece. Yeah. There's also, I think there's a really important piece of this where the the idea of moving through the world, he, he does this, draws this parallel with nature and regulation and regulating uh, natural spaces. And I think that that parallel is more than just um, an analogy that he uses here. I think there's a really important, meaningful dimension that can seep through that, that there's something about moving through the world and, and experiencing the world as a, a place uh, as a series of places and, and what, what that means that I think is a, a really important part of understanding fundamental human nature, you know, our, our right. sort of embodied experience of the world. I wrote about it in my last book, Pixels in Place. There's so much that that we experience about the embodied, uh, our embodied surroundings in physical space. And it, it's a it's a really important parallel that he draws there. And I think if for, I would just encourage uh, you know, add to the encouragement that yeah. people read this piece because it's very, very uh, well thought out. Idlewords.com. And there's another hopeful thing about that analogy because he says we were able to preserve 
uh, our private, our public spaces and our environment with regulation, that it is possible to regulate and that regulation can make a big difference as it has in the air in uh, London, for instance, um, and as it has with the ozone layer. And uh, yeah. I think that's important. That it is, it's conceivable that there can be regulations that can make this a better place, that we shouldn't uh, turn our back on the notion that maybe that it is possible to fix this with regulation. Yeah. I mean, as much as we rag on GDPR, like it's not the best solution. It's a start. But it's certainly a yeah. start towards like yeah. regulating privacy in a way. Yeah. But it's also like um, this article, the idea of ambient privacy, I guess, it reminds me of just, you know, hanging out with friends and family now and how a lot of people just can't even take in their experiences without recording them oh, or man. documenting them in some mm -hmm. way. And I think that that for me is the thing that I kind of lose like. I, I am sad that we've come to this point as a society where we definitely want to Instagram or Snapchat our meals. Doing it quickly is one thing, but I know a lot of people who will spend several minutes before they even start eating to make sure they have the right lighting, the right the right perfect pose for it. And that to me seems deeply sad. Like we 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 have forgotten just how to eat because we have to document it before we eat. But that's true of any like vacation spot or anything too. I see so many people rather than absorb their surroundings or what they're looking at, working hard just to like take photos, take videos, and maybe missing out on the experience. Yeah, and you know what's really funny about that too is it's a really good point, the distinction you make between just t capturing it quickly as a photo of your food yeah. versus you know staging the lighting and you know making sure it's all perfectly plated and all that. Um, I, I came across research, it was actually four pixels in place that uh, that talked about that the difference between the way we experience things like, you know, uh, our, our meals when we take photos of them or say like a concert that we may capture with photos or video, uh, I think people tend to, to rail against that and think that that we're missing out on the the being present in the experience. But it turns out there is some studies that suggest that we actually remember those experiences more by having been uh, by choosing to frame them in some sort of digital yeah. capture like that. Yeah. So there's a really interesting nuance of human experience that comes across that it's like a new modality of how we experience the world. But I think to your point, there is, you can certainly go just, too far. Let's just eat, let's just eat folks, yeah. please. <laughs> God, now I thought, so I thought this was just a temporary aberration chris by the way yeah. I, I i might have missed what you were talking about because i was busy playing harry potter wizards unite <laughs> but i thought that this might have been a just temporary aberration that like in years to come we'll look back and say remember that the 2010s and how everybody was on their phone all the time and people would get run over as they walked across the street and nobody really knew what they were eating if they didn't instagram at first remember that wasn't that weird I, by the way, in New York, I have stopped several baby carriages from rolling onto oh the street God. as their parents are like on the ah. phone or something. So, this you don't is think we'll grow we out of this? No, this is it. No. This is and the it'll, future. It'll become more ambient. And then I don't know if that's better or worse, right? If it's in our glasses or our, our eyes, at least now you can tell that somebody may be distracted when it's ambient. Who knows? It will be in our glasses. In fact, we just. Yeah. Went down to San Francisco to get fitted for some new spectacles that show all your notifications. In no, wow. that's a nightmare. Oh, man. Well, that's, you know, I was going to go down and do it because uh, we wanted to review it for Hands on Tech, our review show. And then I thought, no, that sounds really annoying. I am not. <laughs> I am not. So our producer, I made producer Anthony do it. <laughs> this is hell. Like, yeah. That, <laughs> this is my worst nightmare. Like <laughs> it's bad enough my watch tells me I got a text. I don't want right. to pop up in front of <laughs> That's like horrible. And yet there's such a difference between what you're describing and this whole kind of like um, involuntary heads up display almost. It sounds yeah. like it's a terrible use it's of, like of a, the technology. It's like at a clockwork but, orange. Like they might as well just prop your <laughs> eyes open and you're <laughs> you must watch all of your alerts. Uh -oh. <gasps> I think we still have a long way to go to to come up with um, meaningful ways to use augmented reality, for example, to create new layers of of understanding of our context and our surroundings that'll be really cool. So that that's still coming. I think that we'll we'll see some benefit to that. Always but no, upbeat. please don't force me to see my notifications. Always upbeat, Kate. <laughs> Always looking at the bright side. See, that's <laughs> that's good. Just just remind me of people's names. That's what I need. Faces and names. <laughs> I know. I'm really bad at. So just me that too. Was the Google Glass demo. I think. Initially. Yeah, me too. Yeah. His name is Javindra. He just had a baby. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I want to know that. I don't know who you are. Our show, 
if you see me on the street, Devendra, and I walk right by, that's because I don't have my glasses on. Yes. <laughs> my special glasses. Philips uh, Lighting uh, Group is now called Signify, by the way, because Philips is too easy to remember. <laughs> uh, Signify makes Hue brand lights, and they've announced a new kind of lights called True Li-Fi. Transmit data using light waves at the speeds of up to 150 megabits. Now, of course, you, you don't have Li-Fi on your laptop, so you'd have to get a special Li-Fi plug-in. And uh, if you're transmitting from uh, place to place, from Li-Fi to Li-Fi, 250 megabits. This is not the first time uh, we've heard of you, Devinder. You probably saw the demos at CES a couple of years. I've ago. I've seen some demos, but this is the sort of thing where, like, man, it it seems rough. Like, what happens if something gets in the way of that light? Yeah, what if you device? stand in front of your laptop? Uh. <laughs> I'm presenting here. You can retrofit it into existing Philips Hue lights. They have a little retrofit, or you can buy new light bulbs. Uh, I don't know what the cost is. It's got to be expensive. But one of the one of the markets for this is places where you can't have radio frequency. Like there's no Wi-Fi in ho a lot of hospitals, right? Because it can interfere right. with pacemakers and stuff. So Wi-Fi might be the solution there. Mm -hmm. So I thought we we started with a weird light bulb story. Now is it maybe a <laughs> alternative? And I do have to mention uh, that town in Florida that has decided the city council voted. This is a little town called Riviera Beach. They've been shut down, just like Baltimore was a couple of weeks ago, by ransomware. They've decided to pay the ransom $600,000. This is a town of 35,000 people. And they said, we asked security experts, they said we should just pay. Yeah. That doesn't seem like a good idea. <sighs> Especially since you're paying a criminal. There's no guarantee he's going to honor the promise to unlock your data. You could just say thank you very much and move on. Yeah, this is the cost of bad IT, basically. The cost right? of this bad is, IT. This, this is what it is. Like, if you're not updated, you're not fully patched, like, and it's tough. Uh, I think around, like, when the WannaCry stuff was happening, it kind of revealed, like, oh, man, all these organizations, uh, hospitals in the UK, right, uh, were not fully updated and then had to deal with all these issues. So, I yeah, it stinks. I I'm not a fan of like paying the the people keeping your data hostage, but I don't know what else people need to do. Like it, again, we could say the R word. It's regulation. You gotta regulate better updates and better IT support. I don't know. Certainly, how certainly for cities. Really Baltimore. Yeah. <laughs> ironically, the uh, Baltimore ransom guy only wanted seventy six thousand, but to, <laughs> the, to to their credit, Baltimore did not pay. Uh, the FBI always says, "Do not pay." Yep. Because there's no guarantee you're going to get your money back. We were talking on Security Now about a, a ransomware as a service company. <laughs> that uh, and, and by the way, we should point out that a lot of these ransomware is not coming from accomplished hackers. They're just using existing uh, ransomware platforms. This company uh, is retiring. They're retiring. Because, uh, what was the name of the uh, company? I'm going to try to remember. Because uh, they made $2 billion in a couple of years, and so they said, well, I think we're going to stop. So, <laughs> so Put well your head. We, yeah. we never got caught. Does anybody ever get caught for ransomware? There's occasional arrests, but it doesn't seem like, it seems like this is a low-risk crime. Back up your data, well, folks, and get better IT. Nate it, Langston. It is interesting. Go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to no. say it is interesting about the discrepancy between the the ransom amounts for the the That's city in Florida it's and random. Baltimore. It's just random. And, but I also I assume you guys saw too. There's the, an update over the last week that um, the governor of um, of Maryland signed an executive order f to boost their cybersecurity policies after the the Baltimore yeah. attacks. Yeah, good and thinking. I, yeah, <laughs> there's I mean, an been idea. Good thinking. Yes. A few months ago. <laughs> yeah, good thinking. Yeah. Kate, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Hey, thank you. Everybody should read Tech Humanist. Kate O'Neill is the Tech Humanist. <laughs> KOinsights.com, great public speaker. Watch the triangulation she was on last week. It was really good. Kate O on the Twitter, and I am now following you. Yeah. So say good, All right. say interesting things, and don't I make me feel like I had a stroke, okay? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> none of the none of those abbreviations the kids use. <laughs> I won't subtweet you. Thank you. Is it, yeah, don't, whatever that is. Th it's very nice to meet you. Thank you so much for nice being here. Come back you. soon. Nate, thank you for staying up so late. I know it's now, uh, well, middle of the night. Yeah, it's nearly 1.30 in the morning here. My cat is outside somewhere. He's not usually out when it's this late oh, in the dark. Quick. So I'm going to go, go get outside him. and find him. Go get him. Tech editor in Bloomberg doing great work. I really appreciate it, Nate. In fact, just because of you, just because of you, I'm going to pay the 35 bucks a month. I've been I've been pushing it off, and Bloomberg finally said you've had enough, Laporte. We're cutting you off, so now I'm going to pay. So thank you. Oh, right. yeah, that's yeah. good. Yeah, you should scrub to my podcast as well because that's free. What's the name of your podcast? Uh, text message. He had to think about so it. So it's UKTechShow.com. <laughs> Did you say the wrong name at first? <laughs> no, it's just the URL is different to the website because the. When you hear the name text message, you think it's text. Oh. It works when it's written down. It's just not so good <laughs> when it's uh, spoken. So I got a very literal domain. UKTechShow.com for tech message. There you go. With an apostrophe. Yes. I love With that. What a great idea. Thank you. Great to have you, Nate. I appreciate it. Thanks, Leo. Thanks also, of course, to Devendra Hardwar. We always love having you on. And every time I see your by, your uh, byline, I always go, I love Devendra. I think you're oh, great. Smart you. guy thank with exa exactly the right sensibilities about all of this stuff. Yeah, it's always thank a pleasure. You. Senior editor in Engadget. Fun. Great panel yeah. today. And movie podcast too at slashfilm.com. Slash, slash, slash film. Slash film cast. Yeah, Let's not forget. What do you see? What do you like lately? It's a, it's a summertime film fest riot. Oh, it's been a rough summer. It's yeah. Been so <laughs> Where rough. are the great uh, movies? Toy Story 4. That's, no. That's the first great no. one in a very, very long time. I will not yeah. watch a movie with a number in the title. Space Jam 2, <laughs> no. They're really good. At least Toy Story, for some reason, they've done these sequels really well. And yeah, I didn't. I don't know how they could surpass the third one, but I haven't seen four yet. But everyone is telling me it's amazing. I'm going to see it tomorrow. So Pixar really is a genius company. Usually, yeah. yeah. They really are good. I still cry when I see Up. I still cry every time. All of their movies, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Slash Film. Is it is slashfilm.com the best place to go to get the podcast? Slashfilm.com or the Slash Film Cast. Uh, there's a, there's a tab right there. Yeah. yeah. Gets to the iTunes. Yeah. But subscribe, check us out. Was Men was Men in Black good? No. Oh. It's a shame. I, I fell asleep oh. during that movie. You fell asleep. A real shame. Yeah. I never fall asleep during movies, and somehow that one just didn't work. Mm. Yeah. Avoid it. There's a lot of great stuff on Netflix now. You know, there's uh I saw a great little sci-fi movie called uh, See You Yesterday, which is a time travel fun teenage romp uh, set here in Brooklyn. And I think it's worth watching. I just last night we watched the one about mother. On I Netflix. am mother. I yeah. am mother. Yeah, uh, that's creepy as hell. Yeah. I, you, maybe uh, once we get off the air, you can explain what really happened. Because I, <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand. I don't get it. It's one of those movies, yeah. <laughs> one of those movies. Wait a minute, did she, was that, could they, uh -huh. what, huh? Hmm? Yeah, don't no spoilers. Don't, in fact, Steve Gibson warned me about this and I, and I blew it. He said, don't watch the trailer because the trailer tells you the whole story. Netflix trailers are bad. I don't know what's wrong and with them, but they spoil all their Kate, movies. Kate, can yeah. you fix this? Call Reed and tell him it's not working. They autoplay. <laughs> they play the trailer if you, if you stay on the icon too long and then you see the spoiler. I really want to know the data for the usage on that. Oh, no, that's it why. It's so yeah. annoying. They're data driven. It should be a button. It should be a button. It's not that Please hard. Please let us turn that off, Reed. That's all I ask. <laughs> Just you heard him, Reed. Turn off the autoplay. Because yep. I don't want, I saw the trailer and I'm set, my wife and I said, I said, we should watch this. And then this starts playing. And I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> I literally, I screamed. I think I felt bad because I think she was kind of like, what's the matter? I said, Steve Gibson said, don't watch the trailer, and I've just seen it. Now I know what's going to happen. <laughs> uh, everybody tells me I could turn it off, but I have yet to find a place to turn that off. They say on the website, yeah, no, this, yeah. you can't turn it off. You can't. Nope. <sighs> okay, we ended with on a, on a negative note. I want to end on a happy <laughs> note. Uh, it's International Cake Day. Go have some cake. I made that up, but it's true. All right. All right. It is now. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thank you all for Thank joining you. us. We do This Week in Tech Sunday afternoons, 2.30 Pacific.
Uh, that'd be about 5.30 Eastern time. That'd be 21.30 UTC. If you want to watch or listen live, you can at twit.tv slash live. That's a, a variety of streams there for your delectation. If you're in the, uh, the stream live, you should twit li tweet, twit, t chat live. I IRC.twit.tv. I'm losing it. IRC.twit.tv. I'm going through Wizards Unite withdrawal. I know there's, I know there's magical creatures. I gotta go catch them. The chat room is a fun place to hang, but if you're not here live, you don't need to be there. You can just download uh, copies of the show anytime you want at twit.tv or your favorite podcaster. You can even uh, in, go in studio, and a weird coincidence happened today. We have, uh, if you email tickets at twit.tv, we'll, we'll, you can join us in the studio. Audience. We have two visitors, Krister and Henrik, completely independently here, both from Sweden. One's from North Stockholm, one's from South Stockholm. Wow. Weird, right? Huh. Yeah. Anyway, it's great to have you. Thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Uh, just email tickets at twit.tv. We'll put a chair out for you. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. Another twit this is in the can. Bye-bye.